Well, good morning from uh, Paris and welcome to this conference on gender uh, equality in higher education, research and uh, innovation from uh, institutional policies to uh, international uh, cooperation. Now I say good morning, but we have many people registered from, uh, from outside of Europe here. So if you're in Asia, uh, it's good afternoon. If you're in the Americas, it's very early in the night. So, so kudos to you for, uh, for being up. Uh, my name is Simon Muzakio. I work for the uh, communications department uh, of the French National Center for Scientific Research. Uh, we're organizing this event under the banner of the French presidency of the Council of the uh, European Union, which as you know, runs until uh, July of this year. Um, the CNRS is organizing many uh, conferences uh, through July on scientific research uh, and, and various policy matters. And of course, we encourage you to, uh, to head to our website and find out more about these events and of course, uh, register if you're, if you're interested. Now, today's conference on gender equality is very timely. Um, it's taking place on the eve of the International Day of, uh, of Women and Girls in Science, February 11th. Uh, this was a resolution that was passed by the United Nations uh, General Assembly in 2015, and it's been gathering steam uh, ever since. So it's going to be a very rich uh, conference in terms of uh, contribution. Uh, we're going to have, so the day's going to go like this. We're going to have two sessions. The afternoon session is going to be a series of two panel discussions uh, on, uh, on concrete actions and, and policy levers to promote uh, gender equality and in international collaborations. We're going to have many high-level speakers from, uh, from a number of countries like uh, India, Canada, Lebanon, Kenya, uh, South Africa, I believe as well. Um, and uh, the, it's gonna be really good to, to get this international perspective on, 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 on such a, an important and pressing issue. Now the morning session is gonna be a series of uh, keynotes on institutional uh, policies and EU initiatives that are currently underway uh, for gender equality. But before we begin, uh, a couple of words of housekeeping. Um, we're going to break for lunch uh, between 12.30 and 1.30 p.m. Paris time. And then the second thing, um, I'd like to remind you that all these sessions are going to be interactive. Uh, you can ask your questions by sending them directly to a participant in the, in the Zoom window called moderator. Uh, and then they're going to make them their way into the, uh, into the, um, into the panel discussions. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to, to welcome the chairman and CEO of the French National Center for Scientific Research, uh, Antoine Petit, for his uh, opening statement. Uh, I believe he'll begin with, uh, with a few words in French uh, before diving uh, right into uh, English. Donc, Antoine, uh, c'est à vous. Merci beaucoup, Saban. Hello, everybody. I, I don't know exactly why I should speak French, because I think most of people do not understand French. So, so let me shift directly to, to English, and I can say bonjour uh, and welcome. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to, to be with us today. Uh, uh, thank you uh, to, to Samam and, uh, and his team for organizing this event, uh, which is indeed on a, a very, very crucial subject. Uh, I think we, we all pay attention uh, to, to gender equality in uh, higher education research and innovation. We uh, all know that it is a, a subject that we share worldwide. And I think it's very important to share also a, a, good, uh, a good practices. It's clear that nowadays international uh, cooperation is crucial for scientific excellence. It's clear also that mobility and international cooperation are very important in scientific careers. It's also true that gender uh, equality policies have been implemented at institutional level in many uh, research uh, performing organizations or universities. Uh, but it's also true that not enough attention uh, has been paid to gender equality international, in international scientific cooperation. And that's why uh, we, we propose that uh, uh, in the framework of the uh, Présidence Française de l'Union Européenne, uh, such an event uh, to, be, to be organized. It's a part of a series of events that CNRS uh, have organized uh, around research and Europe, uh, and it concerns uh, open science, uh, uh, ERC, uh, brain drain, uh, and a, a lot of subjects. But we really thought that it was important to, to share our good practices concerning 
concerning gender equalities and, and international uh, cooperation. It's clear that we, we face uh, potential barriers and difficulties like uh, legal and, and regularity barriers uh, like for quotas, cultural barriers also, but also difficulties related to maternity and parental leave all or dual careers. Uh, we have to take this into account, but nevertheless, I'm convinced that gender equality can and should be promoted in scientific international cooperation through very concrete actions. And uh, I am sure that uh, our debates uh, today will help us to, to share these uh, concrete actions in one uh, area or one country or one part of the world and to, to extend them. But also, I think we have really have to pay attention uh, to increase the participation of women in international programs, steering and executive committees, and uh, invited speakers. That's something we, we try to, to do uh, in CNRS, taking into account also the differences between disciplines. We, we know that the ratio of uh, female scientists is not the same in mathematics and uh, biology, for instance. So this is as, have to be taken into account. But uh, nevertheless, we all have to make progress in every discipline about uh, this, uh, this, uh, this subject. At CNRS, we try to, to, to be exemplary, if I can say, or to do our best, but we, it's never enough. And so we try also to share. So we, we, we have a, a specific agreement, for instance, on gender equality actions that we sign with CNRS Lebanon. We organize also French Indian workshop on women in science. Uh, we participate in EU-funded uh, projects on gender equality in higher education research and innovation. But I'm really convinced that the panel discussions today, uh, which will gather representatives of Europe, but also, and that's very important, uh, of uh, international cooperation partners countries like Brazil, Canada, India, Kenya, Lebanon, South Africa, US, of course, uh, uh, just to, to sit a few will definitely provide new perspectives on, on how to promote gender equality through concrete actions and in B or multilateral programs or agreements. Concerning CNRS, you, you all know that CNRS is, uh, is uh, strongly committed in international cooperation, and we try to be a, a major player at the international scale. So we have a lot of uh, international uh, relations. We have a network of offices uh, located uh, in, uh, in key global scientific hubs in Brussels, Washington, Rio, Tokyo, Beijing, Singapore, New Delhi, Pretoria. Uh, we, we also have a, a lot of uh, framework agreements, so we really want uh, to be a, a key actor uh, concerning international relations. We want also, uh, we try to have a, a, a really a gender equality policy. Uh, we were one of the first uh, higher education and uh, research institution in France to create a, a gender equality unit 20 years ago in 2001. Uh, we have a gender equality plan since uh, 2014. Uh, we also try to, to encourage uh, women to apply for higher positions. And uh, we also uh, develop uh, e-learning uh, on gender bias for recruitment panels and all the stuff. That's what we would like to share with, with you. We will be uh, clearly more than happy to, to, to hear from your, uh, your uh, actions, your proposals. Uh, and, and once again, I am convinced that concerning this uh, key subject, uh, we, we, we will be uh, more efficient all together by sharing our, our experience, our, also the limits of what we did. And uh, so thank you very much uh, to all of you to participate to this, uh, this uh, webinar. And I think now it's time to move, uh, to move on from institutional gender equality policies to the uh, integration of gender equality issues in international cooperation programs and agreement. And I really wish you a very fruitful and successful meeting. 
and I will be more than happy to hear for your recommendations and your suggestions. Thank you very much and have a, a very good and fruitful day. Thank you. Thank you, Antoine, for these uh, opening words. Uh, we're going to now go straight to uh, Sweden for our first uh, session on institutional policies and uh, EU initiatives for, for gender equality uh, that will be chaired by Carl Jakobsen, the senior advisor of the Swedish uh, Research Council. And before I give you the floor, Carl, I'll just try to remind our participants that they can ask questions uh, to the moderator and they will make their way into, into, the, into the session. Carl, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, my, my role is really just uh, to be the chair for three very eminent uh, speakers. Uh, it's Marcella Linkova, who is head of the Center for, for Gender and Science at Czech Academy and Sciences. And there's Mina Stareva, who is head of the uh, gender sector at DG Research and Innovation at the Commission. And Elizabeth Kohler, who is head, head uh, of the Gender Equality Unit at CNRS. And I will just show a, a slide here if I can let get the uh, technicalities to work. Let me see. So the session is institutional policies and EU initiative. We will start off with Marcella Binkova, who will talk about gender equality in international STI, overcoming epistemic injustice for responsible research. Uh, we will go on with Mina Stareva, who would talk about gender equality in EU research and innovation. And Elizabeth Kohler will talk about the EU funded gender SDI project. And after that, we will have a very short discussion about priority actions for gender equality in higher education research and innovation. And this uh, discussion will be uh, kind of fueled by, I hope, questions and comments from uh, the audience. And ending at 12.30. So again, please ask questions and make comments in the meeting chat. So I just go on to invite uh, Marcella Dinkova to take the floor. Thank you very much, Carl, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it is a huge pleasure to be here with you today, and it's really great to see that the topic of gender equality in international cooperation uh, has garnered such a huge uh, uh, support and attention of, of the community, and it's really great that the French presidency uh, is paying attention to this topic. I will start sharing my screen now. Uh, hopefully this will work. Um, can you please confirm that you can see um, the- We can see. see, we can see. Fine. Okay. So once again, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I will just say a few words about uh, myself. I am the head of the Center for Gender and Science at the Institute of Sociology of the Czech Academy of Sciences. And for the past four years, I was the chair of the Standing Working Group on gender in research and innovation under the ERAC committee, and also the coordinator of Horizon 2020 project, uh, Gender Action. And I will actually be uh, presenting some of the work and results and recommendations uh, that resulted from the work of, of this project and the group. Um, international cooperation is clearly a crucial feature uh, of uh, research and innovation but it is also where global inequalities, marginalizations and injustices have historically played out. Research likes to think that it operates on the meritocratic ideal, but over the past decades, we have seen proliferation of scholarship on the various ways in which epistemic injustices and coloniality of knowledge to refer to Anibal Kihano's work, continue to be manifested. And this also pertains to gender equality issues at intersection with other axes of inequality. 
gender equality is a core value for the EU, and as such, it is reflected in the specific policy governing international cooperation in science, technology, and innovation. But it is also a site where the global epistemic injustices are enacted. And so I will now start my talk, and uh, I hope that we can engage with some of the recommendations that have come from the work of the Standing Working Group and the Gender Action Project. So I will start by recalling uh, the most recent ev evolution in the EU policy related to international cooperation in science, technology, and innovation. As you can see, once again, gender equality, diversity, and inclusiveness are among the fundamental principles and values of the new communication on a global approach to research and innovation. And this confirms a tendency in EU policymaking where also in the 2012 Commission strategic approach, which was called enhancing and focusing EU international cooperation in research innovation, uh, it was stated that uh, the promotion of the role of women in science and the gender dimension in research uh, were included in the principles of external action. And so with the current global approach, we can see a very important shift to include also diversity and inclusiveness, so moving beyond gender equality, but at the same time, we also see that we are staying at the level of principles and values. And this is something that I will get back to later in my talk. So it, it is really well recognized today, I would say that significant global inequalities exist not only in economic and political dimensions, but also in the epistemic one. Uh, which concerns the opportunities to produce and use knowledge and to have one's knowledge recognized as authoritative. Not everyone has equal ac access to have the knowledge they produce recognized as authoritative. And these inequalities, which are often gendered, have been repeatedly shown to be a result of long-term historical, colonial, and post-colonial developments. Uh, and of course, the economic the political and the epistemic are intertwined. They are intertwined with issues of intellectual property rights and protections, issue, issues uh, related to patenting, uh, but also uh, protections, uh, for example, in clinical trials, et cetera. And so some of the inequalities that, that we see are manifested in three different aspects, in the structure of the research endeavor. So in the indices that we use to measure uh, quality and performance in research, uh, in the distribution of research funding and infrastructure globally, and in publishers, where publishers are located, uh, who has control over the publishing process, who sits on the editorial boards, etc. The second aspect is the knowledge. So there are definitely uh, global language inequalities with English being uh, the, the prominent uh, reference language. But it also uh, pertains to what is recognized as authoritative uh, knowledge, as I already said, uh, which publications get published where and who cites whom. And these inequalities in the citations and publications are not only gendered, but of course, uh, other axes in, of inequality uh, pertain here as well. And then the third level are the agents. Who are the authors, co-authors? How is authorship attributed? Who serves on the editorial boards who carries out peer reviews, and uh, how mo mobility uh, plays out internationally. So these are the three main levels at which the global uh, inequalities in research and innovation are played out. So I will now turn to the uh, work that we have done in uh, gender action uh, and in the standing working group in research and innovation. So, it all started uh, with the Council conclusions on advancing gender equality in the European research area uh, adopted at the end of 2015, which addressed the inclusion of gender perspective in dialogues with three countries and invited the uh, Standing Working Group on Gender and the Strategic Forum for International Cooperation uh, to prepare an opinion. And so to, to produce this opinion, uh, in the Standing Working Group and SFIC, we developed a survey uh, that was distributed among national authorities in 2017. And this resulted in a report uh, 
that found that uh, gender equality issues were rarely integrated in international agreements and funding programs in science, technology, and innovation between the EU on the one hand and non-EU countries on the other. And the second finding was this was not a priority for national authorities. Uh, in gender action, we followed up on uh, this work uh, with uh, a second survey to see whether something has changed. Although, of course, this was a fairly short period of time, but we were interested to see whether in response to the findings that the Standing Working Group and the Strategic Forum produced, uh, there has been a development. So again, uh, we carried out a mapping among national authorities uh, and research funding organizations uh, in the EU uh, member states and associated countries, but we also carried out a literature review uh, to see uh, the knowledge production on gender equality in research globally in all uh, uh, parts of the world. And uh, we also carried out a survey among um, uh, organizations uh, that work to uh, address gender inequalities in research or improve the position of women in science or girls in science. And I will get back to this uh, in a little bit. So first I will go uh, to the results uh, uh, from the mapping among the national authorities <clears throat> and the comparison that we can draw uh, from the 2017 and 2019 mappings. So the degree of change in the efforts that the national authorities uh, made was, was really minimal. We did not see much evolution uh, between the two rounds of the mapping. Uh, the, number of national authorities that made any efforts in the area of gender equality in uh, international cooperation continued to be very low. We can see the numbers, only one country reported activity out of 17 in 2019. Um, we found, and this also uh, squares with the approach at the EU level, that gender equality tends to be included as a value uh, with the definition of several objectives to promote, for example, women in science, technology, and innovation, but it then is not uh, developed into concrete actions. Also, what we found is that the national authorities lacked motivation uh, to address these issues in the future, and they claimed to be uh, interested in receiving support to develop this area than they were in 2017. And also, the number of national authorities monitoring gender aspects was very low at three, and only half of the 2019 respondents uh, who did not monitor would be willing to take up monitoring in the future. So we can see that these results were not really very encouraging. And uh, there were uh, persistent difficulties that we identified. Uh, so the inclusion of gender aspects in bilateral and multilateral agreements uh, in uh, international cooperation was, was very limited. Uh, and it tended to be addressed at the operational level of programs and calls. Uh, there was a lack of examples and guidelines. Also, the support for human resources was limited uh, and the availability of financial resources to address these issues as well. And this was identified as one of the uh, difficulties for national authorities to include gender perspectives in uh, international cooperation. And as I already mentioned, uh, there are not many national authorities or research funding organizations that monitor and evaluate uh, gender aspects in the international cooperation that they have. Now, going to the uh, survey among the uh, organizations, uh, this was also carried out uh, in 2019. And the number of answers that we obtained from the women and science or gender and science organizations uh, that, that were full, that were complete in the survey and could be counted in, it was 65. You can see the distribution of uh, the organizations across the uh, global regions. Um, so it, it was a fairly, fairly good uh, uh, sample. Uh, we did have uh, several or a portion that uh, did not identify the region that they came from, uh, but nonetheless, we included their uh, answers. 
And so what were the main findings uh, that, that we uh, received from these organizations? Um, I, I don't think that this will be very surprising, but, but the main hindrances uh, to women's participation in research uh, were really shared across the globe. Uh, so these fall under four distinct rubrics. One, stereotypes and toxic behaviors. Uh, the organizations reported that the issues that they were dealing with uh, were uh, the, the masculine gendering of the scientific discipline, uh, the cultural and societal expectations related to the roles of women, uh, the machismo of higher education, but also the lack of support systems and uh, women's mentors to overcome um, stereotypes and provide positive role models. Uh, the second uh, was work-life balance and uh, clearly this continues to be an issue uh, everywhere. Uh, so the uh, networks reported uh, issues of uh, the conflict between the role of caregiver and work. Um, but also that the research uh, work conditions were not family friendly. And I think that we can sometimes relate to this uh, in Europe as well. Um, the third one where, uh, was systemic gender uh, discrimination. Uh, so the organizations reported uh, discriminatory hiring practices, the existence of the leaky pipeline, the glass ceiling, the lack of opportunities for women to progress up the uh, research hierarchy. And the fourth issue were economic and material is, uh, issues. So lack of funding um, and unattractive wages were the most important findings. Uh, to continue, we also asked about whether they were aware of any actions, uh, especially in international cooperation between the EU and, and their country. Uh, there was not very much awareness of these issues. And uh, the organizations reported that when actions are put in place, uh, they are often not suited to women's situations. Uh, there are not enough of those activities uh, to really make an impact. And that they also benefit often the privileged groups of women in the given country or region, which speaks to the importance of intersectional approaches to tackling gender equality. So based on this work, we have developed uh, recommendations that I will now turn to. So the first one is really to work to prevent the reproduction of subordinate integration of third countries research teams in consortia and uh, avoiding uh, the reinforcement of unjustified global epistemic inequalities, including uh, gender inequalities. And here are several of concrete uh, actions that can be taken at the uh, level of either research teams uh, in international cooperation, but also at the level of research funding uh, organizations. So uh, one for the RFOs uh, is to encourage appropriate forms of engage engagement of all research participants uh, in the wording uh, of research calls. Um, ensuring appropriate and lim uh, legitimate sharing of intellectual property rights, uh, tackling salary inequalities, including the geopolitical ones. Uh, th this is hugely important also um, for the EU level and EU international cooperation. Uh, another issue was not to apply strict age limits as eligibility criteria. Uh, especially in mobility schemes, because this can have impact, especially on uh, researchers who are mothers with uh, caring commitments. Um, provide effective assistance to researchers and their families with visa and immigration procedures. This was really mentioned as one of uh, top priorities uh, for incoming researchers uh, to Europe. And what was also mentioned as very important is to include uh, same-sex partners uh, in the support provided who may not be officially recognized in the researcher's home country because, of course, this, this differs. And then implement effective mechanisms to report and deal with sexual harassment and gender-based violence in the receiving EU countries because we know and 
there is an, an ongoing uh, project UNICEFE funded by Horizon 2020 that looks into gender-based violence in academia in the EU. Uh, we will see what the numbers are, but we know that uh, mobile researchers, uh, especially from non-European countries, uh, are at higher risk of gender-based violence. The second area of recommendations is to strengthen the role of local communities and grassroots civil society organizations uh, in research collaborations. Uh, so the uh, message was very clear that it is necessary for the EU research teams to make special effort to reach women uh, researchers for collaborations and to encourage where uh, appropriate the inclusion of actors from local communities and civil society organizations uh, that, that are closer uh, to the research needs uh, locally. And also to reserve a designated share of the program or project budget for actors from local communities and civil society organizations, including women's organizations, so that their needs can be reflected in the design of the, of the research. Uh, the next one is to provide space for a proper negotiation of the research objects and interests that will equally benefit all parties involved. I mean, in science and technology studies, in feminist science and technology studies, in, in post-colonial studies, we have examples from the field where people come in with good intentions uh, to uh, develop innovation or to study issues but sometimes uh, we do not pay enough attention to the fact that uh, what gets researched and how the question is framed needs to be relevant also for the local communities. And so this, this is a very important aspect of the um, uh, epistemic justice issue. Um, Related, related to this is also uh, the issue of evaluation. And we have a major initiative here now in, in the EU related to how uh, to revise our assessment practices. Um, so one recommendation was also to uh, evaluate the success, uh, uh, not to evaluate success uh, of a project strictly based on established quantitative uh, bibliometric indicators and also to recognize publications in different languages uh, for various local audiences, um, as well as the impact on local communities. So not go only through uh, you know, the H index and uh, impact factor, et cetera. And lastly, also to articulate the gender and the possible gendered impacts of research and innovation in, in the content. Uh, this is clearly high on the agenda for Horizon uh, Europe, um, uh, but we need to do more also uh, in uh, the uh, bilateral and multilateral cooperations that are uh, coming uh, nationally. And so uh, it is really high time that, that we all agree to require uh, uh, an obligatory consideration of gender in the content of research and innovation uh, so that we avoid situations where the knowledge produced is not uh, equally useful for all segments of the population oh, uh, and also to provide funding to explore and monitor the unintended gendered aspects and consequences of research projects. Uh, because we have heard from the uh, women's organizations uh, that, that sometimes uh, innovation that may see beneficial from one uh, perspective has gendered consequences that have negative impact on local communities of women uh, making their lives harder. Uh, this, for example, was an example of, of seed development uh, uh, that that were, was more resistant uh, to uh, environmental attacks, but also took longer to cook. So then it uh, resulted in the women from the local community needing to travel uh, more to bring larger uh, volumes of water and also more cooking time. Um, so what I want to conclude with is that um, we really need to move beyond uh, values and principles. We need to think about how to concretely uh, tackle gender equality, diversity, and, and inclusiveness 
in concrete actions and provisions uh, and uh, obligations for research teams when they uh, cooperate internationally. We need to take seriously the economic inequalities and dependency that is manifested in the sites of knowledge curation, such as the access to journals, grants, and uh, intellectual property rights. Uh, we need to attend uh, to local gendered inequalities and in hierarchy so that we unwittingly do, do not contribute to reproducing them. And we need to address intersectional gender dimension in research and innovation. So these are the messages that I would like to close with. Uh, there are uh, references, uh, the presentation can be made available. And this is just the attribution of the sources of funding that contributed uh, to this speech. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Marcella. This is a hugely interesting speech. Uh, do I have any questions from the audience? If so, in the chat. Otherwise, you can post your questions at the end of the, the session. So I, I will ask uh, Marcella at the end of the session to, to highlight some of her recommendations. So if, if not, I turn to uh, invite Mina Stareva to take the floor. Please, Mina. Thank you very much, uh, Carol, and good morning to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a really a, a great pleasure for me to be here with you. I must say that I've been looking forward to joining this important presidency event, um, conference event to discuss with you, of course, what the European Union is doing to support gender equality in research and innovation and to foster a pipeline of women researchers, innovation, innovators and scientists across the EU and beyond. Of course, here we speak about the international um, uh, dimension, about the international cooperation perspective. To complement what the two other panelists actually present, I would focus more on the uh, European part, on the European research area, but of course, um, with uh, having in mind the focus on international cooperation. Before we start, I just wanted to present very bri briefly also myself. I'm heading a small but fantastic team of very committed colleagues to really make sure that gender equality is a reality in the field of research and innovation. Under the leadership of our commissioner for education, research, innovation, culture and sports, Maria Gabriel, but also uh, of our director general, Jean-Éric Paquet, we do also coordinate what is called uh, the gender equality matrix within DG Research Innovation, which gathers colleague, colleagues across the DG Research Innovation, but also provides synergies with other DGs. And in this way, we actually make sure that gender equality aspects are not dealt in isolation, but are really efficiently considered in our different policies and funding uh, parts of, the, of, the, of Horizon Europe and beyond. So, of course, let me start uh, with my... Um, um, first slide, uh, probably by saying that, of course, the meeting of today is also with a very symbolic date, because tomorrow at the International uh, Day for Girls and Women in Science, we, of course, we are going to celebrate the achievements of those, those fantastic girls and women in science so far. Uh, but we are also going to take stock of the challenges, on the barriers, on the gaps, on the problems uh, we all encounter, and on the challenges ahead on what are the next steps and what are our responsibilities, jointly and individual responsibilities to make it happen if we all believe in this. Um, so in this sense, uh, last year has been instrumental in setting the ground and shaping the policy context. So uh, now, as I say, as I think actually, it's really the need for us to put together our efforts and ensure that there is a robust policy coordination across the border and across all actors to make sure that what is actually put there in terms of policy instruments and values and principles are really implemented through, through concrete action. So next slide, please. And here I should really thank also the organizer for, for assisting me with the slides because I had some technical issues. Um, before going to the policy context, I would like to display a few figures. And indeed, the She Figures 2021 edition, which is our um, pan-European uh, um, 
landmark publication on the state of gender equality in research and innovation across the EU, but also at the international level, provides an overview of the reality on the ground. And I would say many of, of you know it already because you live it in your daily life. So let me just very briefly put some facts and figures um, so that we are more or less on the same page when we discuss uh, gender equality in research and innovation. So, and indeed here, while most of the findings are at EU level, these trends are um, applicable to all countries in the EU or beyond. Also, we see those numbers at international levels uh, too. So starting with the good news, of course, we have almost reached uh, gender parity at PhD level uh, in all fields considered. But also all disciplines considered, only a third of researchers in the EU, and this number is also uh, valid at international level, are women. And the numbers are even more, more striking when we look into the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields uh, with uh, cl close to 20% uh, um, of researchers being women. Women occupy just 26% of the top academic positions overall, and only 18% in engineering and technology. And among, among the heads of uh, higher education institutions, the gap is still huge. We can see it, women holding less uh, than 24% of these positions. Um, very importantly, uh, looking into these numbers, the latest She Figures edition 2021 paid a specific attention to the issue of um, women in leadership, women in decision-making positions, access to the highest levels, actually university presidents, rectors or deans, but also departments and laboratory uh, chairs is still hampered by, by very important barriers. So we did actually uh, produce the policy brief looking into these barriers and providing some sort of recommendations um, and, um, on how to address those. Uh, for of how to empower women to take up these roles, including, of course, support schemes, gender targeted quotas, gender balance search committees, uh, etc. Uh, we can discuss this later on more in detail, but I would invite you to have a look at the She Figures report and especially also on the policy briefs. And last but not least, of course, we, have, we should not become used to it. On the contrary, women's research and innovation careers have been disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic to make matters actually worse in this. And in particular, when we look into the young researchers population affected also by um, precariousness of contracts, et cetera. So going to the next slide, to the policy context, these numbers more than ever actually uh, render uh, even more pressing the need to reaffirm gender equality and inclusiveness as shared values and principles within the European research area and within our international cooperation in research and innovation. Um, so, of course, there is the need to address the persisting gender inequalities, there is the need to actually look into what are more recent trends, uh, such as the need to address gender-based violence in academia, which unfortunately occurs also in the academia and research and innovation circles. There is the need to address the very low um, level of integration of gender dimension research content, as Mar Marcella just referred to. So within the European research areas of member states and associated countries, we actually work together uh, with the national administrations, universities, research organizations, and funders to develop, co-design, and implement inclusive gender equality plans and to open up our policies to intersections with grounds uh, for discrimination, such as uh, ethnic origins, disability, age, sexual orientation, and identity, identity etc. Looking at international uh, level, with the um, 2021 communication on the global approach to research and innovation, and Marcelo also referred to that, uh, the European Commission places an important focus on the fundamental values. Uh, and principles for uh, cooperation uh, with uh, strategic partners, including gender equality, diversity, and inclusiveness. Um, and very important, importantly, next slide, please. This shared understanding that 
in order to make a change, one should really look for transformative, in, uh, tr inclusive transformation of the research in, uh, innovation organization, meaning uh, implement a structural change through gender equality plans, is also shared understanding by member states. And this is crucial because they are the key actors to implement actually national reforms and to support the change at national level. So, one thing is to look into the new council conclusions on the European research area from 2020, but I would also like to emphasize that these, um, uh, these aspects of fostering an institutional change and also fostering the consideration of gender equality aspects uh, when it comes to uh, international dialogues with our strategic partners, third countries in the field of science, technology, and innovation has been something that member states have been calling upon since 2015. And this is precisely why we have actually um, um, put in place, we have actually supported a project under Horizon 2020 to promote a gender perspective in the science, technology, and innovation dialogues between the EU member states, associated countries, and uh, our strategic international partners. This is the Gender STI project, and you will um, learn more about, uh, about it, of course, in the next presentation. So I would not focus into this. With the next slide, I would just like to present you briefly now where do we stand in terms of member states commitment because the era communication and the global approach, this is what the Commission puts forward, of course, a product of a co-design and um, co-design consultations with overview with stakeholders. In the last month, um, the Council, the Competitiveness Council, has been very active in developing, in adopting actually a few very key documents for actually um, our work in the next years. Uh, the first one to consider is the Pact for Research and Innovation in Europe, which sets gender equality and inclusiveness as a principle and value for ERA, but also which puts some concrete actions um, in terms of priority. And then the Council conclusions on the governance of the European Research Area. Um, with this council conclusions, there is a very important annex, uh, which is called, called the European Research Area Policy Agenda. And within the European Research Area Policy Agenda, there is one uh, particular action which focuses on gender equality, um, and which also refers to uh, the Ljubljana Declaration. And this is the last document you, you would see on this slide. Uh, led by the Slovenian presidency last year, uh, there was a very important uh, declaration uh, endorsed by almost all member states, different associated countries, and also international partners on gender equality and research and innovation, laying down a roadmap of key priorities for the next years to come. So if you go to the next slide, um, this is what the priority action for gender equality in the era policy agenda looks like. What is very important to know is that this agenda will be implemented uh, on a voluntary basis by member states and by associated countries. So there is clearly a commitment towards the action, but it is also um, that we are in an ongoing process of uh, further endorsing these objectives. So. I would very quickly uh, go through them. Uh, these are not new, but are extremely important. Uh, first, of course, is uh, coming up with this new approach to uh, develop inclusive gender equality policies and implement a change through inclusive gender equality plans. And when we speak here inclusive, we do refer to um, gender equality plans which do consider intersections with the grounds of discrimination, but inclusive also means um, including the private sector, uh, working with the private sector. Inclusive also means a gender equality plans for all, uh, no geographical, um, I mean, all uh, geographical inclusiveness should be considered. So, and to really make sure that this works, we need an efficient policy coordination mechanism. We need member states on board. We need research funders on board. Um, and of course, the Commission is fully committed um, to be part of this uh, policy coordination mechanism. An important outcome uh, deliverable actually in this policy agenda, which is fully endorsed by member states, is the need to develop a strategy to counteract gender-based violence, including sexual harassment in the European research system, um, but also to ensure that actually gender equality um, is efficiently implemented in working environments through institutional change. This uh, again, we refer to the gender equality plans. And last but not least, 
is the need to develop uh, principles for the integration and the um, evaluation of the gender perspective in research and innovation content. And of course, here we need research funders on board, uh, research funding organizations. So going to the next slide, so be very brief. Uh, all of this, of course, it, we cannot, our main instrument to implement it is uh, um, with our main funding program for research and innovation, Horizon Europe. And with Horizon Europe, actually, the Commission is strengthening uh, its commitments to our gender equality in research and innovation, and I would say changing gears. So um, if you go to the next slide, the legal basis actually sets gender equality as a cross-cutting priority, but we also have introduced some new um, legal provisions. Um, in particular, and I would focus with one slide on each of those, the, the first two, we do introduce one new eligibility criterion, which is for certain type of legal entities, the need to have a gender equality plan in place in order to uh, receive uh, funding, European funding. An important change also with Horizon Europe is the way we consider the need to integrate the gender dimension in research and innovation content. In comparison to Horizon 2020, where we had uh, targeted calls, gender flagged calls, now we do consider that all research and innovation um, topics, research, should integrate a gender perspective, except if um, specified otherwise in the topic, um, in the topic description. And of course, gender balance continues to be a ranking criteria um, with a reinforced actually feature. So if you go to the first, uh, to the next slide, please, um, probably just to, as I said, this is an important novelty um, in Horizon Europe, the introduction of eligibility criteria, uh, which of course builds on our commitment to uh, sustainable institutional change. So public bodies, research and higher education institutions from the European Union and associated countries must have in place a gender equality uh, plan in order to apply or for funding or to receive actually funding. Um, and indeed, as I said, promoting an institutional change through gender equality plans is today our key policy instrument for, to achieve a long-term sustainable advancement um, in research and innovation in the fields of gender equality. And this is not new for us. We have been funding uh, the implementation of gender equality plans since already the end of FP7. So today we can say that we have supported more than 200 organizations um, in the implementation of such gender equality plans. And we have supported also the creation of a community of practitioners, community of trainers, um, policy coordination at national level, so that we uh, have quite a lot of knowledge and expertise available. But to help also institutions across Europe, we also offer um, concrete support through uh, something that we built recently. It's called, uh, um, well, it's a pilot for a knowledge uh, facility on gender equality plans, uh, within which we have de de uh, developed a very extensive uh, uh, guidance, which provides, uh, provides useful tips on practices around, around each of the gender equality plans building blocks. I will not go into detail, but we do consider that gender equality plan should have four um, mandatory building blocks. Uh, and then also we do recommend such, uh, some important thematic areas to be addressed. So the guidance, and uh, you can see actually, the, um, you have the link on this slide to the guidance, provides really an extensive uh, number of examples across all of these areas. The next slide, which I wanted to present, is on the um, second novelty, making the integration of the gender dimension in research and innovation content mandatory. It is actually an umbrella term which covers uh, the integration of sex and or gender analysis through the entire cycle of the research and innovation, uh, of research and innovation, actually from setting research priorities through defining concepts, et cetera, uh, to evaluation and reporting results. I mean, it's the entire cycle. Uh, and very importantly, this is different from addressing the issue of gender balance uh, uh, and equal opportunities in the project's teams, uh, members, and among participants at conference. This is really about the content of research and making sure that whatever is produced is applicable to all uh, citizens. Um, yes. So to go to the next slide, which I believe is my last one for this round, it's a very packed slide. 
Uh, it's uh, our policy priorities for action for the next year to come. Um, which actually, uh, of course, starting by uh, enforcing and monitoring what I just presented, so the gender equality provisions and requirements in Horizon Europe. In terms of policy, there is the need to develop inclusive gender equality plans and policy, um, which actually consider at least the following elements. I mean, within the inclusive gender equality policies, uh, the knowledge and practices on intersectional gender equality policies. And we are not yet there at all. This is something new. The term is new. It's used for the first time in the gender equality strategy of the commission uh, from 2020. Um, and uh, currently we are actually doing a mapping uh, through a study, a mapping of practices at uh, institutional level and at national level to support uh, uh, such intersectional strategies. So, I, uh, some call it I gender equality plans, other call, call it gender equality plus policies, etc. So we are learning from what is out there um, and to, 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 to see how to build commonly, uh, co-design together with you and also with our member states, a concept of uh, intersectional gender equality policy, which we would be able then to enforce and monitor. Um, as I said, this is very important also in terms of national um, priorities. It's the need to um, come with some sort of a baseline, a EU code of conduct or EU baseline on gender-based violence in research and innovation organizations. And we do have an important project in place that is working, um, uh, that is currently working on providing policy recommendations also in that area. Commitment of research funders, it's a key. Uh, that was the integration of um, gender equality principles. Uh, and of course, uh, and this was one of the latest points uh, quoted by Marcella, the need to integrate the gender dimension in the research funding, the need to tie funding with the integration of gender dimension. Um, important priority for Commissioner Gabriel is to address the underrepresentation of women in STEM fields. And this is also why, why the recently adopted European strategy for universities addresses this issue, the gap in the STEM fields in particular, and suggests um, the development of a roadmap of activities leading to a manifesto um, on uh, STEAM to attract more girls and women and retain actually in those fields. And this is also perfectly aligned with um, the focus on girls and women in STEM within the European Year of Youth in 2022, which we will also celebrate tomorrow. Uh, very important is to address the impact of the pandemic on gender equality, in particular uh, on women researchers and women innovators, also specific focus on young researchers, and we are about to kick off an expert group working on this on 9th of March, um, which would address different aspects, um, I mean, on the impact of uh, COVID on uh, uh, women researchers' performance and productivity, among others. And of course, gender mainstreaming. Um, across all activities. Uh, I must conclude probably by saying that uh, I'm a huge fan of gender mind streaming, but only when it comes also with concrete activities. Uh, so this is also clear commitment in the global approach adopted last year, uh, where of course, um, member states are fully committed to come up with the monitoring mechanism and concrete actions to implement the global approach um, under the European Research Area Forum with a dedicated group uh, already of national administrations on this. We do have a colleague of mine uh, in the next panel discussion who will probably focus on this more, coming from the International Cooperation Directorate. So, uh, Carl and dear guests, of course, I will stop here and we'll be able to take questions after the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mina. I have uh, two questions uh, in the meeting chat. Uh, I, again, I encourage everyone to, to post questions in the meeting chat, address them to moderator. Uh, we have uh, one which is actually, how is gender equality in education taken into account in the Ljubljana Re Declaration and what will follow from it? Do you have any views on this? Well, uh, first of all, uh, this is also a very positive sign that we have a common commissioner. So the European Education Area and the European Research Area are uh, mm -hmm. work fully in synergies under the leadership of Commissioner Gabriel. And as I said, gender equality is one of her very dear personal and professional commitments, starting also from her previous experience in DigiConnect. 
uh, meaning one of the first um, documents addressing gender equality in education was the Digital Education Action Plan, where there is a specific focus on uh, gender, uh, gender equality in, uh, in the field, but of course concrete actions in terms of training and um, additional support. With the recent European, education, European strategy for universities, um, again, one of the priority is given on, uh, on the uh, gender equality and diversity, where there is specific focus on STEM, and probably the question came before I concluded my last uh, slide, where exactly I, I mentioned that uh, there is a concrete deliverable to, for the Commission to work with stakeholders and co-design a STEM manifesto to attract more girls and women in STEM education and career um the research or innovation but also uh, of course there is clearly the commitment for for the, the the requirement for all universities to set in place a gender equality plan or a inclusive gender equality strategy in full synergy with what we actually uh, pursue under the european research area and we we must also say that of course the european alliances the european universities alliances are our test beds we do we do actually um work um we have several mutual learning seminars with them. We try to work together and to learn from each other. So the European alliances are really uh, on the lead for this. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I have one other, one other question from myself, actually. This is about the gender-based violence baseline. Uh, is you have some kind of survey, baseline survey for research and innovation organizations. I hope you mean higher education organizations, uh, institutions also. Uh, can you tell us something about this baseline about gender-based violence? Well, so we do fund uh, a project um, under Horizon 2020 that is looking into, of course, research innovation, looking at higher education, uh, higher education establishments. Um, one of the main outcome of the one of the outcomes of this project is to provide the recommendations to policymakers, research funders, and uh, academic organizations on how to address um, on how to address uh, gender bias violence, how to uh, counteract, how to prevent, and how to pursue. Um, clearly, already since few years ago, we do hear uh, constantly a reference to uh, the need to address gender bias violence. This is also one of the outcome of the Finnish Presidency Conference on Gender Equality. Some time ago, before the pandemic, uh, where actually there was a very strong call for, uh, for the EU to come with some sort of a baseline. So, of course, we are currently working with different stakeholders, including in the context of the higher education agenda, um, to co-develop um, a product. But uh, we are at, we are on, uh, at the very beginning. We actually build on our pro ongoing projects to come with something that would actually uh, be considered as a code of. Uh, conduct, etc. We don't have any, any concept for this. It's just uh, uh, what we also suggest to uh, member states to discuss together and to see what would be the best, actually, also to, to be enforced at national level. But of course, we do consider higher education. Uh, we cannot, uh, as of starting from Erasmus Plus program to, to Maris Krudowska and the other Horizon uh, Europe part, this is a very important issue that we tend to address. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mina. Uh... I think we can turn to, to Elizabeth now. Uh, please, Elizabeth, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Carl. And uh, well, good morning to everyone. And uh, thank you to all of you for attending this meeting. So it's uh, for me a pleasure to have the opportunity to present the Gender STI project on behalf of all the project partners and there are many and uh, so well uh, my name is Elizabeth Kohler so I'm the head of a uh, uh, gender equality unit of the uh, French National Center for Scientific Research and uh, the unit that is organizing uh, the conference today so uh, well I'm going to uh, share my screen and um, so we'll a uh, few words about uh, gender STI. Uh, it's, as you know, it's really dedicated to gender equality, science and technology, 
uh, in bilateral and multilateral agreements and policy dialogues. So we're focusing on, on these legal political frameworks where, well, as it has been pointed out by Marcella and Mina, there's still a lot to do, I would say. So that is why um, we are a quite large consortium of 18 organizations from 16 countries, well, six European countries, Spain, who is coordinating the project, Portugal, Finland, Austria, France, Italy, and then 10 international cooperation partner countries, Canada, United States, Mexico, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, South Africa, South Africa India, South Korea, and China. Well, the project is uh, funded by the European Union on the Horizon 2020 program uh, for three years. So we started a bit more than one year ago, uh, November 2020, and the project will end uh, in October 2023. So, well, I would say it's a short time uh, considering the huge challenge, but uh, we'll do our best. So here you have the map, of course, we could have invited many more countries, but it's more to work on prototypes and then to be able uh, to extend to other countries. So um, what are the main objectives? It's really to foster gender equality and bilateral and multilateral ST cooperation agreements between Europe and international cooperation partner countries. And we are focusing on three key areas. It's really gender equality in science careers, gender equality in decision-making bodies, and the integration of gender perspective in, in research and, and innovation content. We think it's also a very important issue. So based on these three focuses, we performed the first mapping of uh, gender equality uh, STE, STI bilateral and multilateral agreement. And well, it's no surprise, we could find almost nothing about gender equality in, in these agreements. So either informal agreements, meaning more uh, framework agreements, uh, and even then you had more programs on research, international research implementation activities, there's, there are only a few examples, uh, I must say. So if you look also at uh, calls for proposals, access to grants, uh, evaluation, monitoring of this project, uh, there are real, really only a few examples. And uh, the dissemination of the results also, it's not really better. But, well, we sh should stay optimistic. So. Well, we then tried to see what are the main barriers. And uh, so we, <clears throat> we performed some interviews and circulated a, a questionnaire to find out more about what is really hindering uh, the implementation of gender equality measures. And uh, here, well, it's a bit broader because uh, we are, of course, working together with uh, era related groups with ministries, but also include also foreign affairs. So uh, because it's it's really uh, concerning both, I mean, the ministries and higher education research and, and foreign affairs, uh, gender equality bodies, uh, uh, structures, associations, research performing organizations, universities, of course, and research uh, funding organizations, because they are important as well, uh, uh, very important, because uh, we need more funding and to help more women. And uh, so they're included also uh, in the scope of a project. And, uh, and then we're working with, with international key actors, obviously. So, um, well, based on these findings, we'll try to formulate recommendations and we are just starting. So I won't say anything about potential recommendations. I mean, Marcella presented a lot of, of recommendations. Um, here it's focusing more on 
really the agreements, what can be put in an agreement, in a, in a program, in, in a policy dialogue, strategic roadmap. Um, but um, these recommendations, we have sort of, of uh, think tank co-design labs, we call them, with, of course, uh, representatives from all our partner institutions and in the projects, and we're broadening also uh, these, uh, these co-design labs to, to more experts. Uh, it's, uh, we'll see if the re recommendations will, of course, deal with the free focus area we had, so scientific careers, uh, more uh, decision-making bodies and uh, gender balance and decision-making bodies and the integration of uh, uh, gender dimension in research content. So we hope to be able to, uh, well, to publish with a set of, of recommendation this year. Uh, of course, with uh, also, well, discussions with, with, with other stakeholders and based also on, on uh, of course, uh, gender action and, uh, and the work uh, provided by Marcella and, and, and her team. So uh, we're not starting from scratch, but uh, of course not, uh, but it's uh, to put it in sometimes very well legal documents. I mean, to put something in provisions in a legal document, it's not so easy. Sometimes you can have, well, a sentence like non-discrimination, but it's it's not real. It's not related to to, to concrete actions behind that. So, um, uh, how can you be very efficient in in such a framework of more legal documents or broad um, STI roadmaps between the EU and and regional areas or between two countries, two organizations. Um, it's not so easy. So, uh, um, but uh, we've got already quite a lot of ideas, but and hope to be able to, to present more uh, pretty soon. So at the end, but this is optimistic, we would like to gather all these resources, expertise and partners what we call an observatory on gender and STI related to international cooperation. It's the idea to structure in a little bit all these efforts and to make them sustainable. So um, it's a sort of, well, uh, material experience sharing knowledge. Uh, the way we will gather it the exact format is still under discussion, but uh, we would like to, to uh, have something which, which can attract also more people and, uh, of course, in coordination with other projects, but uh, to give some visibility, because uh, after three years of a project, there should be some sustainable visibility and, and structure. For this, it's important if we want to move on and on this well, a uh, difficult issue of having more gender equality and in international scientific co cooperation. And uh, related to this observatory, the, the participants would be sort of community of practice. So uh, able to, to, to provide advice, to, to participate in conferences, and uh, uh, it could be a broader community of practice, of course, including, we hope also, many participants from international uh, cooperation partner countries because it's it's really important to have not only a good balance gender balance but uh, the balance uh, between eu and uh, non-eu international cooperation partner countries is really very important and um, that is why uh, i think also today we will have many more uh, inputs coming from from different countries and uh, this is uh, really something we need and something which is definitely what we are working on and, uh, and uh, for, for next step would be to get not only good policies uh, in, at EU level and uh, a lot of other countries have uh, excellent uh, gender policies, gender equality policies as well, but uh, 
how can well we give a real added value of all these existing policies in uh, international cooperation agreements, activities, actions. That's really the challenge. And uh, so please, uh, we, we need you all. And uh, so it will be a pleasure to, to further, well, uh, discuss this with you. So thank you very much. And uh, if you want to have more information, please uh, check our website. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, uh, could I just ask you, uh, well, I have a question directly. Uh, uh, to whom are uh, the recommendations of the Gender SDA project uh, aimed? I mean, where do you aim your recommendations? Well, the recommendations are, are targeted towards more this decision makers, meaning at ministry level, uh, level of, uh, well, RPOs, RFOs. Uh, right now, it's more um, related to decision makers, but, uh, well, maybe later, uh, but it's not enough, uh, for sure. Uh, but uh, it's really sort of guidelines for decision makers um, a lot of these decision makers are men so uh, we need more women <laughs> that's for sure but uh, yes because uh, negotiating uh, drafting these agreements these roadmaps uh, uh, strategic roadmaps and uh, policy dialogues are involving high level representatives High level representatives should more uh, interact also with bottom up initiatives. This I fully agree. Um, but of course, we can disseminate them widely also to, to, to the scientific community. Uh, but we would like to, to influence, yes, to, to provide recommendations for decision making bodies in the various uh, <clears throat> structures involved in it, ministries, funding agencies, universities, and that's, uh, but uh, we are aware and we are really also fostering initiatives have, have to, to come also well, bottom up. Thank you. Uh, now I have a question for, for Marcella and I, again, I remind the audience that you can post questions uh, just choose moderator and in the chat and, and chat away. Uh, but I have uh, two questions for Marcella. Uh, uh, oops, it's far away in the chat. So it's uh, to Marcella, do you have concrete recommendations about cooperation within Europe? We see huge differences between more advanced studies, uh, countries, including Sweden, Spain, Germany, Norway, and country with more difficult gender policies, how can we reduce the existing differences within Europe? That's a good question for you, Marcella. Please. Well, if this concerns uh, specifically gender equality, I can say uh, that the policy platform that we had first in the Helsinki group under the commission and then uh, with the standing working group on gender in research and innovation, has been hugely appreciated by all, all the countries, all the members. And, and I think that it's really vital that uh, there continues to be such a policy forum un under uh, the new ERA forum. This would be really my hope because I think that this is, this is a perfect way to share experience, uh, build expertise and develop a community of practice at, at the policymaking level. So this, this is one. Second, uh, it's, I, I may perhaps say this, but um, we are currently uh, negotiating uh, a grant agreement on a new project. Um, uh, and I hope that this is okay that I'm saying that uh, uh, to continue the work of gender action. And it will, uh, it intends to build two communities. One of them is a community of practice of research funding organizations. 
And, and I really hope that the opportunity for the uh, funders to network, uh, sh share experience and develop concrete policy solutions will be another great opportunity to, to tackle uh, gender equality issues. And we will see whether and how we can perhaps address uh, as well international cooperation uh, specifically. So I think that, that we have um, uh, some instruments that uh, can be developed further. Uh, I think it's really important that the member states um, uh, confirm the priority of gender equality, confirm uh, their support for the Lublania Declaration with continuing a policy platform under the ERA Forum. And then from the ground, we will do what we can uh, through the instruments that we have av available. And then I want to also mention that uh, there are communities of practice at the institution level. I really want to highlight uh, the G Jane C, G E N C E E community run uh, by Polish colleagues that brings together institutions from Central and Eastern Europe. Because I can tell you sometimes we really do tackle different types of resistances than some of the other countries. So I think that, that we have solid ground uh, to, to work on. Thank you, Marcel. I also have another question for you. It's, uh, I hope I've understood it correctly, but uh, one of your slides, you ex just talked about gender inequalities at local level. And the question is, what is difference or difference, uh, the difference between the gender inequality at local level with the more general level? Well, I think that was the question. Mm -hmm. So what I meant by this, and this was this, this came through the survey among the uh, various organizations supporting women in science, and also we held two mutual learning workshops to deepen uh, our understanding of what we were gaining from this survey uh, among the organizations, was that there are, of course, then local differences in the countries, and uh, there are differences in who has access to people in positions of power uh, that are locally based, that we as, for example, EU project uh, coming in the region, coming in the country, we, we do not have any understanding of the local inequalities. We have no understanding of who has access to people in positions of power, uh, uh, the gatekeepers in the local research communities. And so if we go only directly to the people in positions of power in the countries with which we cooperate, we do not have a chance to access other constituents that are uh, uh, relevant. And we basically through this, by going through the stakeholders uh, and the gatekeepers, we reproduce uh, the power hierarchies that exist in the countries with which we want to cooperate, with the research communities that we want to cooperate outside the EU. This is, this is what I meant to say. Okay, thank you. Uh, you have a, a third question. Uh, could you elaborate on the use of the term uh, inclusive in the intersection? Is there a strategic consideration behind the use of both them? Was there overlap or difference? Well, we're uh, conceptually uh, in a little pickle now uh, because, of course, intersectionality has been a field of research uh, uh, that that is being developed, uh, and there are huge scholarly debates about how to understand intersectionality and how that uh, evolved. Uh, whether we uh, put side by side various axes of inequality, which has been what was traditionally done in the EU, or whether we really carry out intersectional analyses that look at how the various intersections work and marginalize different groups of people. Now, uh, the reason to use inclusiveness is that this is a term that is increasingly used at the policy level. This is something that is also used by the Commission now in Horizon Europe. Uh, the Commission understands inclusiveness along three axes, and uh, I am speaking to Mina, who can uh, elaborate more. But the reason uh, 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 to use both is that for policy level, the relevance is there with inclusiveness. But of course, when we want to tackle the issue 
uh, in scholarly terms, um, it is necessary to speak about intersectionality and how we theoretically and empirically uh, develop uh, the concept of intersectionality. Thank you. Uh, now I want to uh, ask uh, Mina because I, uh, I suppose you have received some some question direct to yourself, uh, which is well, you can do that also, but please do it to the moderator. But I ask uh, Mina then to answer the questions. Thank you very much, Carol. And actually, the, the question that you just asked was uh, sent to me also as a private message. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so indeed, and I, I, I think that it's a direct reaction to what I presented um, in terms of um, commitment in the European research area to work towards inclusive gender equality plans and gender equality policies together with member states and research and innovation actors. And indeed, there are few, two elements to consider at least. One is that intersectionality is a very new term and it's difficult to understand. It needs, you as a research com community would know it, it took us so many years to speak about the integration of gender dimension and still people are not aware of what precisely this means. So it needs quite a lot of communication, quite a lot of efforts, quite a lot of trainings. Intersectionality is it's new. Intersectionality is one aspect of what we call inclusiveness. Inclusiveness is at least a different level. One thing is to have a gender equality plan which considers also the intersections with different social uh, determinants, uh, grounds of discrimination, and we can mention those. Normally, at European jargon, when we discuss intersectionality, we actually refer to the six grounds of discrimination in the European Treaty. So uh, whether we take them at an equal level and whether we look them through a gender perspective, this is also uh, these are also different practices across countries and organizations. But when we speak about inclusiveness, it's actually how do we consider those intersections and we open up to the interactions with the private sector and we also make sure that we have all member states on board. So it's really geographical, uh, thematic, uh, sectorial inclusiveness and intersectionality. And I just wanted actually to come up to the first question that was asked to Marcella, because I think that we cannot agree more that without a policy coordination, we would not have an efficient implementation of all those objectives. And we, will, we have been working together in co-designing something that is really uh, changing the game, that is really a game changer. It's ambitious, it's bold, it's something that is, is it's really, um, it's pioneering, of course, CNRS, you are also pioneering, and France is pioneering in the, in the way of setting a mandatory requirement for gender equality plans for higher education institutions, and it's giving a great example. But if we do not joint effort, join efforts, learn from each other, exchange, um, exchange experience, uh, ideas, and views on how to implement it, we will not be there. So we will just stay at ambitious, uh, at ambitious level, but not implemented. And so this is precisely why from our side in the commission, we fully support the creation of a group of member states working on the implementation of gender equality priorities within the European Research Area Forum, which is still to be set, but we already express it very clearly. But this is also precisely why we also support the topic under the widening uh, and the European Research Area work program of Horizon Europe to make sure that uh, um, projects, policy projects of this importance and gender action co continue to feed policy advice and to actually uh, collect an overview of uh, practices across member states, because we know it, it in some countries is very difficult uh, and also at all levels, I mean, uh, this is clear. So do I have another question or shall I uh, also uh, go to uh, one of the questions? Uh, you, I, I have two questions for you also, but, but you can uh, take your questions first, perhaps it's the same, I, I don't know, but, but I, I can pose you one question now, which is uh, a little bit tricky, uh, it's, it's actually for, uh, it's a question about CNRS, uh, in physics more women are retiring than we are hiring, and so uh, what is done about this, so, so is monitoring a uh, number of researchers in different uh, fields who, who will think about these things it's except of course the cnrs itself but uh, do you see who is to respond to that question is it for me yes i think it will be for you yes uh, otherwise uh, for for I, I think it's the commission well, what, I think how, I... 
I started by this. Uh, numbers in the STEM fields are very low, and in particular, in STEM fields in particular, this is precisely why also the commissioner is taking this very seriously and is trying to engage into some additional work on uh, attracting and retaining uh, more women into the STEM field. So this is one thing, and this would be our, our let's say, commitment to work uh, toward this in this year, together with universities, together with the different, uh, with, with those fields that are particularly marked by, uh, by this. But there is also something different here, which is, I mean, gender balance in research careers and in research progression has been a core era priority since 2012, and we do see it, so numbers are very low, um, uh, and in some cases are going down. Uh, what we actually do on our side is, uh, um, we do consider the, the, the access to uh, research career in those fields as important part of the gender equality plan. So when we actually request the research organization to have a gender equality plan, we ask them in particular to look into the um, research careers opportunity that, uh, and attraction of women into some specific fields. Uh, some universities are proceeding with gender quota. We do have different. Uh, we do have different examples of soft measures of uh, on how to attract or how to retain a woman. So um, I think that I can post also in the chat a link to our guidance on gender equality plans, where we do have some concrete examples mm -hmm. across the different scientific disciplines, where we would have also examples in the field of physics. But of course. One thing that our commissioner is very much putting also on her agenda, uh, which is important. Uh, I'm much more behind the structural change, but I think that it's very important to have role models, to have to give visibility to those women, to speak about them, but actually to to give them recognition, uh, recognition in our daily talk, recognition in our daily work, recognition through awards, recognition through championships, but also engaging them in some sort of activities of acting as an agent of change. So one thing is to recognize we do have the prize for women innovators, other women. Um, mm -hmm fantastic women researchers in different fields, including in, in physics. But those, of course, there, there comes also the own responsibility of acting as an ambassador of change and uh, connect with different networks, different associations in the different fields to also learn from, from each organization on how best to attract uh, uh, those uh, profiles that are missing. Okay, and I have quite a good network on women in physics, actually. Uh, I must say that I'm attending an event. I don't want to make a promotion on women in big science tomorrow, where exactly we will discuss also these issues on how to value and connect those yeah. fantastic women. I have an, another question, uh, which is a little bit tricky. It's uh, maybe to you, Mira. It's, it's, it says like this. I'm not quite sure whom it's from. But at our organization, we have received some criticism and resistance from researchers uh, who see incorporation of gender uh, consideration in research plan as extra work and even as barrier to the research. This must be, uh, what, what, what would you recommend? Uh, this is, why do we do this? So, I don't feel uh, that this is the question for me, to be honest. So resistance, we can all speak about resistances. And yeah, yeah, okay. They exist at all level. Uh, this is precisely why, actually, since 2012, we do foster an institutional change approach. We do think that in order to make a change and to avoid this, you need the top level commitment. You need your management on board. You need your actually senior and middle management on board. And um, uh, how to say it? We have been working on what is really the minimum criteria for gender uh, equality plan, but the minimum applicable to all institutions so that they're really able to participate in Horizon Europe. One of the criteria, the first one is top management. If you don't have it, uh, those resistances, they will continue. Second mm -hmm. criteria is having resources. If, if someone does not give you, if the top management does not give you the human, the financial, the necessary freedom or space to actually really work on gender equality, these resistances will co continue. So this is precisely why we also think that the approach for the gender equality goal, it's ambitious, it's bold, but uh, it, it, it is really the, the, the key instrument with which we think that we can achieve this institutional change and change these patterns of behaviors. They're everywhere. I think that we can meet those in all countries. It's, uh, but but, but I, th I think in this case, I think it also was about the gender in consideration research plans. So, so I mean the gender in research contents, I guess. Yes, the gender in research contents. 
so uh, I can speak uh, as uh, Mr. Sarvan, I can speak as representative of the commission. It's a matter of social responsibility. We cannot do research without really considering the impact, the potential, because it's not necessarily the case, but the potential impact uh, research or an innovation can have on men or women, uh, different groups of men or women, girls or boys, and gender, consideration of gender is really about the social, um, um, social and behavior patterns, etc. Of course, gender brings added value. It's a, it's a matter of having research for all of us. It's a matter of a business case and new opportunities. So in a way, um, I think that what would be useful here to respond to this question is we have worked with an expert group of highly, um, I mean, of excellent experts across Europe, but also uh, under the leadership of London Schibinger in Stanford University, uh, and also with a Canadian expert to actually develop um, a common understanding the, on how inclusive, how actually uh, inclusive research leads to excellence and uh, better output. And we have looked into different case studies in different scientific fields uh, so that the experts, they really work to providing some dedicated tailored made uh, methodologies on how to address the gender perspective in research and innovation content and the recommendations on why this is important and also the potential risk of not considering the gender aspects. So each time a person is, has difficulty to convince and actually to explain why the, there is a need to do that, uh, we could advise to look at this report and uh, really uh, benefit from the uh, fantastic work of the expert group and recommendations that are out there. So maybe I can post it, but uh, sorry to taking so much the, uh, so so long the floor. At the end of my presentation, I have useful links, and there there are actually quite a lot of those, including the um, report, the link to the report on gender innovations, which was released uh, already in 2020. Actually, yeah, time flies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 2020. Okay, thank you, Mina. I have a question for Elizabeth. That's, uh, can you explain a bit more on the 16 countries that participate in gender STI? What are the differences and how do you learn from each other? Oh, well, um, we learn a lot from uh, especially international cooperation countries. Uh, that's well within six European countries. There are some differences, but uh, they are not so important. Uh, but definitely, I mean, there are well, Canadians are, have a lot of. Uh, um, of gender dimension in research content, especially health, for example. Um, while in other countries, it's it's I would say not a concept that is really they are familiar with. So um, then, more or less, we see um, the same thing for well the glass ceiling. Uh, but I must say, in, in, in countries outside Europe, there are sometimes more young uh, female scientists, more uh, women with PhD uh, than in, in, well, in, in computer sciences or, or nanotechnologies than, than in many European countries. So I think we could learn also from, from them how they attract more, more women to, to, to these careers. So, um, but I think for the glass ceiling, it's more or less the same everywhere, so. Yes, thank you. I, now I have to, only a few minutes left, so I want to give you all three uh, opportunity to say uh, what's the most important or do you have to, uh, final words from the speakers that is. So uh, should I uh, ask you in, in the order of, of speaking? So I start with Marcella. So final words from Marcella. Okay, Peace. thank you very much. <laughs> um, I think that the most important thing is that the issue is on the on the table because uh, the one thing that we can see uh, and we could see in the results of the surveys that we did is that uh, we have robust scholarship 
uh, we can name the issues. Uh, we have the conceptual frameworks, but this is rarely translated into concrete actions taken at the policy level and at the research funder level and in the research teams. We often take an easy way out uh, because we are always short of time as researchers. And what I wanted to stress in my presentation is that maybe we really need to take time uh, to think about the impact and responsibilities that, that we have uh, coming from privileged region of the world with resources that are sometimes lacking and going back to responsible research and innovation, going back to epistemic inclusiveness, really make sure that we uh, pay attention to including uh, the uh, relevant local communities, reaching out uh, beyond our established networks uh, to uh, find women researchers that we can uh, draw in and the associations that uh, we can work with. Uh, I think that it's also our responsibility to take care that we do responsible research globally. Thank you, Marcella. Uh, now I give the floor to the final words for this conference from Mina Stareva, please. Thank you, Carl. What, what... I, I've been thinking while, while listening to Marcella because I think that we cannot repeat it more than that, that we do have a very good policy ground. We do have a already good established value and principles, and we have been working towards those quite a lot. And we need to take the responsibility of those. And we need also to be aware that we are all on this um, journey together. And it's, uh, it's, it's not commission, it's not the EU, it's not member states, it's not researchers on their own. We are all there. And we all have our part to bring that together into really a coherent framework that makes a change. Otherwise, we stay on words. And of course, in this policy framework, which we all worked towards, there, of course, the need to pay specific attention to the biggest gaps, to where we do see the, the particular those areas that we are still lagging behind because the, despite of the efforts, despite of the joint work uh, together, one of the gaps is, of course, I just spoke about it, uh, the, the, the integration of the gender dimension, and this is across the world. I mean, we need to be, to, 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 to be sure that whatever it's done, it's really applicable to all of us. Otherwise, it's a huge waste of opportunity, and sometimes in the field of health of lives. Um, very importantly, we need to support more, um, to support the access of women to um, to research careers, to leadership positions, to decision-making positions, and uh, in specific fields in particular, but globally. Um, and we need to keep going. I really think that we need to be a very, very, very committed. So uh, resistance is at the toe level, but the most important is that we really know where do we want to go and what are the actions to achieve it. So I'm very happy to actually work within the commission with such a fantastic team, but also with a very motivated community of, uh, of gender uh, practitioners. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Mina, for <laughs> these encouraging words. <laughs> well, Elizabeth, you have the final words of the, this session. <laughs> Thank you. Please, what? Thank you, Carl. Oh, well, I would say we're, it's not enough right, to have excellent recommendations or good um, assessments down there. We are all committed to it, definitely. But uh, uh, I think um, networks of women scientists are very important. Uh, we, we have the example of a European platform of women scientists. Uh, I think they influenced also partly, well, some EU uh, uh, measures. So uh, I think uh, having this at international level or can be between regions or different countries would definitely help because there you can influence also decision makers and you can have also 
a better information flow. We all know, well, for every reason, for what reason, I don't know exactly, but there's sort of boys club, men, all, they get the information for job opportunities at an international level, major conferences they have to attend, and uh, then also the experience. If you can uh, talk to someone who, who uh, lived for two years uh, in a country, how, how is it, uh, how is the, the scientific context, but not only also, well, uh, to, to live there in this country. Um, and more and more, I think these, these networks could definitely uh, also help having concrete actions because, well, women's scientists, we are working for them and they're the core of, uh, of what we are doing in the scientists engineering. So yes, I think networks are very important because it's, uh, well, it's a living uh, action and not just, uh, well, something we write, but really to help these people would be, these networks would be really a success. And uh, of course it takes time. We, we cannot have all women scientists worldwide in one network, but uh, uh, I'm pretty sure uh, this would be, could be a success story, a future one. So thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Oops, uh, sorry, I'm muted. Uh, so I just want to say thank you to the three speeches and thank you for to the audience for the questions. And I'll leave the floor again to the moderator. And uh, thank you very much for this uh, these presentations. Uh, very high level of exchange. Uh, this does close our morning session. Um, my colleague Matthew will welcome you back here at, uh, at 1.30 p.m. Paris time for our two remaining panel discussions, which you absolutely will not uh, want to miss out. So on my side, over and out. Gender Equality in Higher Education Research and Innovation Webinar Part 2. Good afternoon. My name is Mathieu Rouault. I'm a French science journalist, very interested in all the questions related to the way science is done today. So I'm very glad, very, very glad to join this webinar and to be the moderator of the first panel discussion of this afternoon. What concrete actions to promote gender equality in international cooperation programs and agreements? That's a very good que question indeed, but also a very difficult one. Fortunately, we have today six good experts on this uh, topic. Let me introduce them very briefly. Peggy Efua Otiboateng, Senior Science Advisor to the Science Sector at UNESCO. Good afternoon. Do you hear me? Not yet. Maybe I'll push you. I'll continue right. my short presentation. Hi. Yeah, Mark. Hello. Yeah, can you it's hear a, me? It's a great pleasure to have yeah. you with us. Thank you. Thank you for, for being here. Kremena Mileva, Policy Officer at the International Cooperation Unit of the DG Research and Innovation at the European Commission. Good afternoon. Hello. Anais Libebe, I, I, I guess my pronunciation is good, but correct me if it's not the case. You are <laughs> Programs Manager for the, for the um, For Women in Science program at Fondation uh, L'Oréal. Hello. Hello, thank you for the introduction. Anna Maria Fonseca de Almeida, you are co-lead of the gender working group launched by the Global Research Council and you work at Sao Paulo Research Foundation. Hello. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you for the introduction and for having me. 
thank you for uh, participate for this participation second and of course there are all uh, there are also emmanuel royer uh, deputy scientist scientific director at the institute of mathematics french national center for scientific research do you hear me mr royer yes hello uh, thank you for the invitation Thank you too for being here. And Thomas Berghofer, last but not least, physicist, coordinator of General Network, and uh, York from the German Electron Synchrotron. I, I, am I right? I can't hear you. Are you here? Yes, Thomas, yeah. you're here. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> good afternoon. Thanks for the invitation. It's a, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to, to talk uh, with you uh, too. And, uh, in order to facilitate uh, the debate, this panel discussion will be divided into six parts. First, I'll briefly let the panelists present themselves and explain how they see their role in the promotion of gender equality. Secondly, I will ask them what is their personal and concrete assessment on this topic regarding, regarding gender equality in science at the international level, where are we right now? That will be the second part. In the third part of this discussion, we will see how international cooperation can better take into account this question. We will talk about quotas, financial help, uh, family-friendly policies, etc. We will try as much as possible to give examples of what works and maybe what does not work so well to promote gender equality. Then we will talk about the next challenges that should be addressed at the international level in the future. And finally, of course, we will take some questions from the chat. So feel free to share your comments and questions through uh, this chat to the moderator, that is me, uh, so uh, that I can ask your questions to the panelists. So that's the way it will be done. My first, my first question goes to uh, Peggy F. Uh, Oti Boateng. Uh, as senior science advisor, how would you define your role in the promotion of gender equality? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, and all of you connected. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, it's always been my passion for the last 40 years to promote gender equality, but specifically in science. Having worked in Africa uh, and, you know, got onto the international scene in UNESCO and until, you know, uh, two days ago, I was a director for science policy and capacity building. And now I've been given even a bigger role to advise on the whole of the science sector. Very recently. Uh, yes. Yes, Matthew, yes. Very recently. Uh, and I share with you, you know, the importance of my work in the last 40 years, but specifically in the last three years when I led the Division of Science Policy and Capacity Building. Uh, it had three sections. Uh, one is specifically in science, technology, innovation, policy systems, and capacity building, where we provide technical support to member states to ensure that they develop, you know, robust science, technology, innovation ecosystems. Because as you saw with the COVID, uh, countries that had built strong, robust science, technology, innovation systems have built back better on COVID. So. It is, you know, it is imperative and we must do it. But recently, just as recent as November, all the countries in the world, 193 countries came together to say, look, how do we make science efficient, transparent? How do we share data? How do we make sure that nobody is left behind? How do we bring the scientific community, you know, to have a standard setting instrument? And that's why we have the open science. So UNESCO is leading the open science. And I'm proud that my division was able to lead this. So the second part is that, as you will see later in the discussion is that the parity between women and men in science has grown, but there's still a lot to do. 
So the division also pursue, you know, uh, areas of capacity building in science and engineering, where we provide technical support to members. We link, you know, countries internationally to international, you know, centers so that we can develop, you know, technologies, but also in particular now technologies for the future, you know, AI, nanotechnology, bioinformatics, you know, engineering in particular, you know, we also do that. But the third aspect is that we need to link science to local and indigenous knowledge systems. You know, for example, in Africa, there's a lot of technology, there's a lot that has is being developed, pursued by local and indigenous people, but this doesn't fit through, you know, in the scientific world. So our work is how do we link this, you know, this paradigm between, you know, uh, local indigenous knowledge system and the science. So you can see the division that I led for the last three years was the basis for science sector. And the science sector also has water, we have biodiversity. Yes. Yeah. So in a nutshell, you know, this is, you know, where we come from, but we also link with other sectors in UNESCO, uh, which is education, CEI and all that. Not forgetting that UNESCO has two priorities, that is Africa and gender. So whatever we do, we encourage within the context of gender. So this is where, you know, we are coming from. This is where I am coming from. And so that for us, we have realized that gender is key. You cannot develop, particularly science, leaving half the population behind. So. Gender. For you know, for the moment, yes. So this is where I come from, and this is my passion. Thank you very much, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for this very brief and concrete <laughs> presentation. Uh, of course, I have many questions uh, for you, uh, uh, Mrs. Otibuateng, and I've also have good questions. I hope for uh, Mrs. Fonseca de Almeida. Uh, hello again. Uh, what is the Global Research Council? Uh, in a few words, and when and why? Mostly, why did the gender group, uh, this gender working group, uh, launch? Uh, we don't hear you. You have to Sorry. activate your, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for the introduction. Thank, thank you for uh, inviting me. And thank you all for being here today. I'm very glad we have the opportunity to exchange a little bit in this issue um, in these dire times. So uh, the Global Research Council is a virtual organization formed by the heads of science and engineering funding agencies from around the world. Uh, as the name indicates, it's quite ambitious, global, and it's dedicated to promoting the sharing of data and best practices for high quality collaboration among the funders. Uh, it's focused on improving communication and in cooperation and um, also it aims to, uh, to be a resource for those institutions wishing to explore mechanisms that support the global science enterprise and the worldwide research community. Um, the gender inequality uh, question or issue has been a topic of interest for the, the Global Research Council since its launch in 2012. And the gender working group was formed in 2017 uh, following a series of discussions that happened the years before, and it's uh, with the, uh, the goal to contribute to the implementation of uh, the statement of principles and actions promoting the equality and status of women in research. So the goal was uh, more concretely to support actions and initiatives regarding the participation and promoting of women in research, work, the research workforce, and uh, the integration of the gender dimension in research design and the, and the analysis of the research outcomes. So last year, the gender working group mandate was expanded to include a new DI perspective. Um, the gender working group navigates a very diverse field, as you can imagine, and the goal is to be relevant in the dif different contexts. So we have been examining how the funders have been monitoring monitoring gender inequality. And we have been also advocating for the collection of disaggregated data for, for its use to guide policies and to evaluate funding schemes and so on. 
We have been advancing our work on bullying and harassment, focused on raising awareness, but also on advocating for a more decided, uh, clear approach to it. Uh, finally, we have also continued to be working on the integration of gender in research, but giving the funders not only evidence of its relevance, um, but also uh, providing some practical support in devising measures to implement it. Thank okay, and, and we, of course, we will talk about this practical, uh, you know, guides and, uh, uh, and, and you know, I, I think we have to, to share in the middle of this conversation a lot of tips, maybe good practices, may I say recipes. So I think you will provide a good examples of what works and uh, I'm very glad uh, that you could be with us once again. Emmanuel Royer, uh, you're a member, you're a mathematician. Am I wrong? No, I'm right. Nope. <laughs> you're a mathematician, of course. And uh, you uh, are a member of the CNRS Genders Equality, Gender Equality Committee. Uh, can you please remember us why um, it has been created? At first, yes, sir. Uh, so I am a co-director with my colleague Martina Knop of of this co committee. Uh, the CNRS has a, a service called uh, Mission pour la place des femmes au CNRS, a Mission for the Place of Women uh, at CNRS, uh, which has just celebrated its 20th anniversary, and has an operational role of setting up concrete actions and observatory of the place of women in the CNRS. This service is led by uh, Elizabeth Kohler that uh, you, you met this, this morning. Um, at the time of his appointment as president of the CNRS, Antoine Petit set the objective of attracting more young women to scientific uh, careers and accelerating the evolution towards parity in all the scientific disciplines. Uh, of course, the, the pool of female researchers that could be candidate for position in science is at the heart of the problem. Um, but this remark should not absolve us from um, taking action. Uh, for example, issues such that uh, the success of female candidates in competitive examination their access to management positions mm. and the professional segregation between the branches of activity of engineers and technicians are points on which we we have to act. Yes. It, yes. I was just wondering if you had, uh, you know, counterparts in, in other countries. Uh, <laughs> Good question. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> I know that CNRS anyway is a specific uh, uh, organism. Not every no, country no, um, in Europe has a, uh, something like a, an organism uh, like yes. the CNRS. But so certainly the, the um, okay. I'm quite sad, uh, sad to be uh, in front of my computer instead of uh, with all of us because it could be interesting to have actual changes. Uh, on, on these different committees. Um, the, the point is that there is um, a local uh, context not to be for, forgotten uh, because every action we could have um, have a, a legal counterpart. I, I mean, there, there are things you can uh, do in Germany that you cannot do in, in France and certainly the reverse is true also. Mm. Um, but okay, knowing what is done uh, in the Netherlands, for example, can help us to to discuss with our politicians. But the, the, the delay is not the same. Okay, uh, we have Thomas Bergofer with us too. Uh, good afternoon. When did you? First of all, I would like to ask you a, a personal question, if if, if you. If you admit, if you, if I can, uh, when did you begin to feel concern as a man and as a scientist uh, about gender equality? Thomas Bergofer. Oh, sorry, but I think you, that yes. you have to open your microphone, Thomas. And then we will talk about the general network that you lead. Okay, we I, I think we have lost 
Thomas, he will be back soon, very soon. Kremena Mileva, what is the role of the International Cooperation Unit as far as gender equality is concerned? Uh, yes, I'm uh, working in, for the European Commission uh, for many years now, uh, and uh, <clears throat> um, I recently, uh, last few, uh, yeah. two years ago, uh, joined the International Cooperation <clears throat> Directorate, um, where um, we are mm -hmm. actually overseeing <clears throat> international cooperation in research and innovation in uh, um, all levels and all um, um, uh, all uh, dimensions, if you like, uh, of uh, uh, research and innovation. So gender uh, equality and gender policy is one of those. Uh, we recently um, uh, adopted a global approach to uh, research and innovation, where uh, actually, um, this global approach brings forward uh, uh, several principles and values uh, which we use to uh, open our um, our uh, research uh, funding to uh, all interested par partners, not only uh, on European but on international level as well. Uh, we want those key principles uh, which are very close to our hearts, such as academic freedom, research ethics and integrity, gender equality, diversity, um, to be agreed and implemented at international level uh, so that we, uh, we can assure that the uh, scientists all around will have a, um, a level playing field uh, and will have security uh, so that they can develop further in their careers and in their endeavors. Uh, this actually will allow a trusted cooperation between scientists on all levels. Um, so, uh, of course, this means that uh, we actually encourage, and um, you know, uh, this is our main role uh, in the commission uh, in where I am, to, to encourage uh, this, um, 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 implementation of our values and principles uh, in order to uh, for our programs to be open as much as possible to yes. uh, to international partners uh, for that uh, of course um, uh, mina uh, my colleague mina already mentioned the number of uh, activities and number in, in, of uh, initiatives we are implementing um, Probably I will also come back to you when we discuss further uh, again. Uh, but just to mention some of them that we actually encourage uh, um, our partners uh, when they decide to participate in the um, uh, grant uh, programs, uh, we put a compulsory condition to uh, participate uh, to have uh, uh, gender equality plans for uh, uh, public uh, institutions and also uh, we uh, encourage um, for the private institutions uh, to have uh, to uh, utilize a best effort obligation. I will probably speak about it uh, later on if uh, uh, if we have time. Uh, so, um, in a nutshell, that's what we are doing in the International Cooperation Directorate and um, trying to promote as much as possible our yes. values. Yes, and that's a big challenge. Uh, even big progresses uh, have been <laughs> have been done. Um, yeah. Thomas Berghofer, do you hear me now? Yes, yes. of course, of course. Okay. Uh, sorry. Fine, <laughs> that sounds better. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, what is the general network? Ah, the general network. <laughs> yeah, um, it is a network that we have founded uh, after a European-funded uh, project, the Genera project. So this uh, project was active between 2015 uh, and uh, 2018 and uh, many uh, 
physics research institutes came together to develop uh, gender equality plans together. And uh, so the, the project was uh, successful in developing these plans and implementing the plans. But at the end of the project, we had the feeling that the mission to change really the inequality in physics is not accomplished and we have to do something together and stick together and uh, you know, keep all the people who are pushing, who, who are active in the field together that yeah, we uh, continue and keep an eye on what is going on. Okay. And finally, we have Anaïs Libebe. Uh, am I am I pronouncing it right? Is is it like yes, that? It is. Yes. yes, it is. Yes. Thank, a huge thanks to you uh, for uh, being here with us. Why and when L'Oréal began to develop actions on gender equality? Um, the Fondation L'Oréal uh, is uh, supporting uh, since a uh, long time ago uh, women across the world uh, by helping them to realize their potential in uh, in the two uh, majors. Uh, areas that are, that are really anchored in the DNA of uh, L'Oréal, I would say scientific research and uh, inclusive beauty. And uh, for the Foreign and Science program, uh, where I'm working on, uh, we have launched this initiative in uh, 1998. Yes. Okay. I can give you more information about the program if you want. <laughs> okay, we'll talk about this in the, uh, okay. later. I, will, I, I would like to um, feel free to, to ask me questions, or to ask the moderator any questions, of course, uh, and, and I will ask your questions to the panelists. And I will uh, beginning now the second part of this uh, roundtable of this panelist of this panel discussion: gender equality in science. Where are we right now? I would like to ask o Mrs. Otiboeteng uh, this question: G gender equality is in the fifth UN, UN Sustainable Development Goal. It's a very important. Uh, goal. As far as science is concerned, are we closed? Are we close to, to this uh, goal? Uh, thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, we're getting there. But we still, you know, have to leapfrog. <laughs> yes, particularly in some areas. And, and I encourage everybody to read the latest uh, UNESCO science report. 2021, which we launched in June last year. Uh, it gives some startling, you know, data. And if you allow me, I'll just, you know, give you a, just a glimpse of some of the data that we have yes. uh, to make the case. You know, you know, uh, we cannot leave women behind in this sustainable development goal. There are 19 goals. The core is science. It has to be driven by science. We need women in science and science needs women, just like L'Oreal said, you know, so how do we do this? So far, you know, with that parity, we've attempted to get 33% parity of all researchers of women, but we haven't got there in the area of science. This is up from 28.4% in 2013. Now we have 33.3%, which is one in every three women has now is in the researcher, you know, group. But what do we see? Uh, when we come into the details of, uh, you know, jobs for the future, and I said it earlier, and I'll just give you a quick overview of some of the, uh, uh, you know, the data. And I'm looking at agriculture, engineering, natural sciences, which means physics, chemistry, biology, we'll put it all together, and ICT, which is, you know, in AI. Just take France, for example. In France, uh, we have 43% of women, you know, researchers in agriculture. When we come to engineering, we have 26%. So you see, it's not even high, a third. And when we come to natural sciences, we have 49%, almost there, but we still have to do it. When it comes to ICT, is 16.5%. So we're way behind. And I'll just give you another example, Denmark. Denmark, we have 64 in engineering, 29. In natural sciences, 54, they're doing well. ICT is 24%. Germany, they are 43. Uh, engineering, 21.1. Uh, natural science, it's you know 46. 
uh, ICT is only 19%, less than 20%. In Vietnam, as an example, Vietnam in agriculture, they have 43. Uh, engineering, they have 47.1%. Uh, and then in, in natural sciences, they have 50.6. So there are more women doing the sciences in Vietnam than men. When you come to ICT, you have 26.4%. So they're even higher than any of the data I've given you for Europe. When you come to South Africa, which is in Africa, you have 53%, 37.7% are engineering, and 50.6%, again, parity in natural sciences, and they are also 26%. So in Europe, we are not there with the jobs for the future. And the jobs for the future is ICT and engineering. So these are, you know, that's basic mm. for you. Mm. So how do we leapfrog? And we need this to drive the sustainable development goal. So uh, yes, to answer your question, we've done quite a bit, but we're not there. So <laughs> but we're we, we we're not there. Uh, uh, thank you very much for sharing these data. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, Thomas Bergerfer, um, Mrs. Uh, uh, Otibo Ateng just uh, uh, said us that it, it, it depends on disciplines, it depends on fields of research, on thematics, uh, this question of gender balance. Uh, do you agree? And what is the, your, per your perception of this, uh, of this question? Does the perception of the importance of this topic uh, depend on disciplines, according to you? Yeah, oh. we need the right policies. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not so sure. It's difficult <laughs> to say. Um, uh, so my own uh, experience is that uh, yeah, males often do not feel concerned about gender equality. So uh, gender equality is often seen as a women's problem. So that needs to be solved by the women itself. I mean, this is, <laughs> it's a bit awkward. Um, I would see it more in the general way. So when large disparities exist, uh, how are minorities treated? So whether it's different sex or uh, different opinions. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, so my experience is not that it really depends on the discipline itself. So physics is nothing particular compared to other disciplines in this respect. Okay. And um, uh, you, uh, uh, um, you didn't answer to the question I first asked you when your microphone didn't work, uh, but I would like you to tell us in, in a few seconds, if you can, uh, why did you uh, feel concerned at the, at the beginning uh, as a researcher, as a, as a, as a man, uh, to, be, to feel concerned about this topic? Ah, yeah, that's an interesting story. It goes back to the late 90s. Uh, I was working as, the astro as an astronomer at the observatory in Hamburg, and uh, <laughs> one day my boss came to my office and said, oh, from tomorrow on, you will be our female representative. I said, what? <laughs> Are you crazy? No, we don't have uh, somebody in our institute who can do the job. Uh, so. I said, I was wondering, how can this happen, that uh, we are only male in, in this uh, institute? But this reminded me on the, on, uh, when the time when I, I studied physics. So I started with 50 students and two were females. Hmm. And uh, later, when I was changing jobs, I, I saw that uh, this situation still continues and I couldn't... Uh, <laughs> understand why 30 years there was no no movement uh, still the same situation and then i thought i have to do something and you've done something uh, yeah, something <laughs> <laughs> krimina mileva uh, what is your opinion about uh, the role of quotas when we uh, uh, speak about uh, you know uh, gender equality or gender balance uh, it is oftenly something that it is uh, mentioned, uh, the role, the, the, the implementation of, of quotas, of course, is a, is a way to, uh, to help uh, promote gender equality, but does it, does, it, does it work? Do you encourage it to promote gender equality in science? Uh, <clears throat> I, um, uh, of course, promotion of quota has always the <clears throat> two sides, but, um, mm, we, we can see that uh, uh, in this particular case about uh, <clears throat> gender equality, this works. 
because uh, we can take uh, as an example, for example, the Scandinavian countries where this <clears throat> was very much uh, encouraged, even um, uh, put as an obligation as regards the uh, bigger companies and uh, uh, in management position, uh, um, I mean managerial positions. Uh, so <clears throat> it, uh, it seems that uh, um, it works, but the thing is that uh, we see throughout the years that um, um, voluntary, voluntary uh, goodwill uh, in uh, all around uh, the, the, the working um, um, area, not only a public sector, but uh, private uh, as well. In, in our case, also in the research sector, all over the goodwill is not enough. And um, it seems um, pressing to introduce um, a top-down approach. Uh, and it, it, uh, <clears throat> we in the European Commission uh, actually are doing this. Maybe it's um, not uh, probably the most popular way to do it, but uh, um, in a way, it's, it gives uh, results. So um, I mentioned already that we have, um, um, uh, comp we, we have a requirement uh, for the participants in our uh, <coughs> pro projects and programs to have, uh, to have um, um, uh, gender equality plans or um, uh, to encourage somehow uh, uh, su such, uh, such plans uh, uh, if they're uh, private sector uh, participants. Um, now we also have uh, more concrete, uh, um, we undertook more concrete actions. Uh, for example, in the uh, um, European Research, Research Council, maybe many of you are familiar with, with its work, um, they uh, adopted uh, their own rules of participation as regards um, gender. And uh, for example, I will just cite you uh, not to, uh, uh, so that I be a little bit more precise what uh, what they have been uh, doing. Um, for example, the, their scientific uh, uh, management, scientific council uh, agreed to, um, um, to have a, a, a maternity counted uh, as an interruption of the, of the uh, career um, in, for researchers, but not in a sense to, to interrupt the grant they are receiving. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, up to 18 months extension for each child born before or after their PhD award. It doesn't yes, and, matter. And we will talk about family okay. friendly policies. Yes, okay. J so, just uh, after them. I just my, my question was mainly works. about, you know, my, my, my question was mainly about quotas. It was uh, your own perception. We are the step assessment, you know, personal assessment of uh, my personal uh, evaluation. assessment. I think, uh, yes, I think if I understand works. you, it globally works. Yes, it works. But uh, uh, in a way, we need to be careful with uh, with uh, putting quotas because next to, to the quotas, uh, you immediately may have a, a question which you may ask or you may not ask. Uh, what if we have uh, more uh, qualified men than uh, the, the woman who is, for example, applying for the job? Or do we need to give a preference to the woman just because she's a woman? Uh, right. and, and, th and that's a, a good a good question and I will ask I will ask to uh, to Emmanuel Royer uh, on this uh, subject uh, a, a question related to that point that you mentioned uh, some female scientists are annoyed by uh, quotas uh, in science because it leads to always asking to the same women to participate to panel or jury etc um, did you hear such uh, a comment 
uh, and what do you think about uh, this? Point yes, of view? so uh, this is indeed a, a debate in the mathematics community, uh, it, but indeed the question contains a part of the answer. The, the, the women with whom I have discussed this issue are not bothered by uh, us by being asked to participate in juries. Indeed, they are bothered by being asked too often and asked not as a an expert, but as a woman who has been on a jury so that men can decide who to recruit. Uh, in reality, there are more women than juries in, in, in mathematics. Uh, it is true that we are not enough uh, women, but not to that extent. Um, on the other hand, colleagues in charge of building juries need to broaden uh, their address book I mean, there are solutions not to ask uh, the same woman every time. Mm. Um, let me mention that the question, does it work, uh, might not be the, the, the good one. The, the, <laughs> the good question, <laughs> sorry, no. Uh, the, uh, the, the question should be, uh, why do not we have women in juries? Yes, I mean, there, there is no reason for this. Mm. Uh, and the, the fact that we need quotas is, is, is quite sad, but... Yes. Okay. Um, uh, young, young women, Emmanuel Royer, young women uh, believe more than, uh, more often than men uh, that they aren't good enough to become a scientist. Uh, it's uh, some, somehow called uh, uh, the, the imposter syndrome. Is it still a reality in maths, as far yes. as France is concerned? <laughs> yes. Um, yes, and certainly not only in mathematics. I mean, this should be the case in many uh, elitist uh, disciplines. So, okay, how to change this? Uh, certainly, uh, it requires that seniors do not hesitate to put forward the most self-effacing young people and to give young women the means to create uh, a network in which they can experience the fact that their skills are needed and, and appreciated. Mm. Um, okay, changing this probably also requires calming down some arrogant colleagues. And at the more global uh, level, uh, we probably need to question the hyper-competitive model uh, of science. Uh, let me take uh, a sporting image. Um, okay, we are in, win in winter, so if you consider an ice hockey or rugby team, uh, okay, the team must be better than the opposition, but it must also be tightly knit team that progresses together. And science is not a sport. Uh, but if we want to compare it to sport, if the team that, okay, the team uh, progresses only if each person is convinced that his or her colleague has not been recruited by chance. And mm. this is what we need to remind all our young colleagues uh, you are not just here by, by, by chance. Uh, okay. We, we were chosen. <laughs> uh, one question uh, to, uh, to uh, Ana Maria Fonseca de Almeida. Um, do we have clear indicators of, uh, of this question? Is it possible to progress on gender equality in science without evaluation, without metrics? Um, did you have some actions on, on, this, uh, on this subject? And I just read the question of Margaret, which is not a question, but a, a, just a gentle reminder. Uh, uh, Firi Asher, we are uh, talking about this question just in a few, uh, in a few minutes, but I, I just wanted to make you know, an ass a global assessment on this situation. And then we will talk about how to work together, may I say, to uh, uh, promote gender equality. And if you have questions that you think should be asked in this round table, please feel free to do it. Uh, and so, uh, Mrs. Fonseca uh, de Almeida, what about evaluation? Hello? I think your microphone hasn't been 
It is, it is now. Sorry okay. about that. Uh, so thank you for the question. Um, it's an important one, I think. So is it possible to progress on gender equality in science without evaluation? So maybe not. Uh, is it possible to progress on gender equality in science without metrics? Maybe not either. But can we find better ways to evaluate? Can we, be, uh, can we find more intelligent metrics? I think so, and I, I may assure you that uh, the Global Research Council is very keen on examining this issue. So evaluation has been a topic of interest for some time, and it has been discussed in different opportunities. Uh, this has led to the promotion of a working group uh, dedicated to explore the issue of responsible research assessment. Uh, this uh, working group was uh, established in 2020. And after that, uh, there was a call for action uh, directed to the funders. So um, the idea né, of this working group is to advocate for the importance of this, what is called responsible research assessment, and to provide guidance and support to participate, participant organizations in embedding uh, a reflection or embedding knowledge in their, um, in their, uh, in their, suite of uh, advancing better ways of, of doing that. Um, this working group is working very closely with the gender working group. And, and of course, we understand that evaluation is a key dimension in all se serious attempts to advance gender equality and diversity and inclusion more generally. So uh, when we, in, in previous discussion, in previous uh, remarks, what we are really talking about when we discuss quota, for example, is, is it possible to adopt quota and at the same time pay attention to the structural, structural um, uh, the structures that are in place and that prevent the advancement of the careers of the women? Uh, can we do that? Uh, it, can we can we act in both in both fronts? Can we consider quota as a, a passing uh, adjustment just to make sure that things progress more uh, more easily or faster and so on? I think this is all uh, uh, a big discussion and uh, something that uh, people are really uh, engaged in trying to figure out how what to do and how to do and. Uh, what would be uh, the best uh, actions to take without, uh, of course, uh, uh, waiting too much to, to, have, uh, to have a change, a real consistent and concrete substantive uh, change in the research landscape. So I would say that this question, do we, uh, do we, can we progress without evaluation? Can we, what kind of metrics can we have that could uh, help us uh, or help the, the research ecosystem to advance this? Uh, I think uh, we don't know, do not know yet, but um, the funders, at least from our, my, our side, my side, what I'm seeing is that the funders are really deeply engaged in this discussion and they are trying to come up with a, 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 an acceptable and uh, uh, an answer that an acceptable answer that can guide uh, practice and that can guide uh, procedures that can guide uh, also um, uh, initiatives and policies. Mm -hmm. And they have allocated time and expertise to explore this. Let, let's talk about uh, international cooperation and, you know, ways to promote gender, gender equality through international cooperation. Um, uh, just before this, uh, this, uh, this, this part of the, uh, the roundtable, uh, Anais Libebe, did the women in science program have a real impact on uh, mentality, uh, long-term practices in terms of uh, gender equality in, in some countries? Did you... Um because yeah. we are talking about evaluation, just uh, <laughs> did you measure that? Yes, uh, so it's quite difficult for us to measure the, the impact on mentality and to make significant progress on the global figures for women in science. But what we can note is that the increasing of our programs and authority uh, really show that we have an impact in the scientific areas. For example, uh, we receive more and more uh, application on our programs. Uh, we can see also that the level of the nominators increase uh, since we see that we receive a more nomination from eminent researchers with major prizes, prizes sorry, such as Turing Prize or a Nobel Prize. Uh, 
Uh, we also see that um, we have more countries represented among our nomination, but also among the, the winners of our programs and also the impact uh, studies of our communication campaigns shows that uh, these campaigns are uh, really uh, visible uh, worldwide and uh, that, um, that these campaigns are also well received by the, the, the target. And above all, uh, uh, what um, helped us to show uh, the impact is the, the feedback that we receive from the, the, the young talent and the laureates that we, we reward uh, because a lot of them, and especially the young one, uh, the younger, the, the young researchers tell us that the, the awards really changed their life and really had a, an impact uh, on their uh, on their career. So, um, mm. that's okay, thank you, th 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 thank you for this uh, this this info because we will talk about the way we can create networks, you know, international networks uh, for. Uh, um, pushing this, uh, the, the, this, this question, uh, gender equality through international cooperation, what could be done? And my first question goes to uh, Peggy Efua Otibuateng. Um, of course, if you have to, I guess, uh, to conceive, to, to build common policies or common actions through uh, uh, countries, through nations on this subject, uh, may, we have to share I guess we have to share some common values about gender equality. Does the gap between the cultural heritage of each country prevent the elaboration of common gender equality policy in academic, in science, according to you? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Matthew. In a way, yes. Uh, you know, uh, cultural of many countries also influences you know, how much or how far we'll go with gender equality. Uh, but what we need to do is, you know, as a country or as EU or as UNESCO, when we pursue to do that, is that we need gender equality policy in academia and even in research. Uh, and it's also very sad now to see that, you know, in, in spite of all this gender equality, uh, we still don't have you know, equal opportunities for women. Uh, so what we need to do is, and we try to help countries is through development of gender transformative policies and programs. And this is where open science comes in, you know, very, very important. And also, we also need to show- What's the link between gender uh, equality and open science? I don't get it. Pardon? What is the link between gender equality and open science? The gender equality, because you know, in open science, we want to make science uh, open information and the data, sharing of scientific data, uh, sharing of information, uh, and also which is transparent, which means that there is, we have to bridge that gender gap. Mm. This is all about open science to bridge okay. that knowledge gap and gender gap. So open science presents us with a great opportunity to do that. Mm. Uh, and also secondly, we need to showcase, you know, what we do. For example, L'Oreal is a good one to showcase distinguished women in, in order not to, you know, to prevent the stereotyping. We also need to enhance our international networks of women. For example, INWAS, International Network of Women in Science and Engineering. We need to enhance that. We also need to mentor young children, young people. It has to be part of our policies. So depending on where we are in the various countries, you know, still girls are not allowed to go to school. Yes, but when you say we, W-E. When I say uh, we. I who mean, is we? We means everybody. Everybody. Do you believe that there are good levels more than others that that could uh, help um, gender, uh, uh, help produce actions, effective actions, concrete actions, as far as this question is, con is concerned yeah, of gender concrete, equality? Yeah, the concrete action is... Uh, you Which know, is the good level, Mike, is, is my yeah. question. <laughs> concrete actions are some including mentoring, mentoring young people. Concrete action are also developing those policies. Concrete action is sharing 
you know, between twinning, between countries, for example, what can, you know, France do together with, you know, country like uh, Niger or Mali, you know, where we can twin? What can EU do with AU in this area? What can they do with Latin America? You know, we need as a, as a global, we need a global change. And this is what we're looking at. This is where UNESCO provides that opportunity because we represent all the 193 countries. And this is where we have developed, you know, gender equality policies. You know to drive this system okay i see a lot of questions uh <laughs> not not enough questions in the chat and a lot of reactions you know in the <laughs> in the in the screen of zoom uh I, I just remember that if you want to ask questions dear participants uh please do that through the chat by asking me as a moderator uh the question and i will ask your questions at the end of this panel discussion to the panelists Thank you very much. You can't, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, ask your question directly in the in the in the live. Uh, just uh, about, uh, you know, uh, uh, model. Uh, 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 you you said a short case, a distinguished uh, woman, um, Anais Libebe. Uh, do emergent countries participate uh, to uh, to the program? And um, is it hard, someone, somewhere, sometimes, to find, you know, uh, models in some part of the world? Um, yes. So we reached uh, emerging countries since, uh, with the international awards, we reward every year five laureates from five region uh, of the world. And uh, uh, as I've said before, uh, we are um, we receive more and more uh, applications and nominations from. Uh, from countries all around the world, and we are really um, pleasantly surprised to see that uh, excellent files from these emerging countries are um, now coming uh, up in uh, our nominations. And uh, also because, unfortunately, in these uh, countries, we have a uh, few role models uh, to inspire um, young generations. So that's why we really uh, also highlight uh, women from uh, these countries and also the the four men in science programs operate uh, its program in national and uh, into a national and regional uh, level uh, worldwide so that's allow us to have a, a broad scope of action and this is um, uh, this is possible thanks to our partners uh, the UNESCO and local uh, local um, other scientific local partners, but also thanks to L'Oreal subsidiaries that operate and communicate uh, locally uh, the, the programs. Uh, let's talk about uh, uh, about uh, family-friendly policies. Uh, are family-friendly policies a good way to address gender equality uh, issues at the international level? What is done on this subject? What could be done? Um, Anna Maria Fonseca de Almeida and Emmanuel Royer, please share your point of view on this very important question. Uh, so, uh, so now we are focusing on the structural obstacles women face while building their careers, while progressing, navigating their careers. So the social, social toy expectations that can create this kind of obstacle in regards, for example, the mo to motherhood and care, care not only of children, but of aging parents and relatives. Then there is also the obstacles created by the institutions where the women work. We mentioned evaluation and we can easily think of the evaluations that do not take into consideration the time society expects women to spend with care. Uh, the other, others mentioned also the lack of mentorship that um, uh, can, uh, that could provide women with uh, tools to navigate this environment. So um, talking about what the, the, the gender working group in, in the GRC has been uh, considered in regards to that, we uh, have um, uh, surveyed uh, in 2018, the policies in place by the different funders that could be considered as having a positive impact in advancing women careers in research. So we um, surveyed a, a whole uh, group of uh, countries uh, and agencies, actually not countries, but the agencies in different countries. 
in different regions with different um, outlooks and different uh, ways of uh, considering uh, the participation of the women in, in research. And we were a bit surprised uh, to realize that um, despite of this great diversity and the great diversity of the space in which the, the funders navigate, almost all agencies had implemented some initiative, initiatives uh, in this regard. So what kind, what kind of initiatives? Uh, most of them have, have some kind of uh, um, uh, a raising consciousness uh, initiative and uh, work towards children, girls, and um, uh, introducing, uh, uh, like uh, advancing uh, in, in age, the introduction of girls to the science uh, adventure, to present science as some, something, uh, something, uh, as I would say, uh, just interesting and um, something that could attract uh, their, uh, their curiosity and their, uh, their ambition, let's say. Uh, so this was uh, very, very widespread. Uh, we had also, uh, we um, documented also that some uh, family-friendly initiatives were uh, present in many of the, in most of the regions, and not in all funders, but most of the regions we had uh, exam examples of family-friendly initiatives. And with different degrees of coverage and with different degrees of depth, but uh, financial, so financial help for parent, parenthood uh, was not yet as widespread as we had hoped, and neither was a clear approach to uh, one, uh, one issue that we consider very um, uh, sensitive, that is the approach to the CV analysis, right? So, for example, one that takes into consideration the range of quality of opportunities available to the researchers, that take into consideration the, the, the difference in the times uh, the different groups have to uh, build a career. We, uh, somebody has already mentioned that, that uh, of course uh, uh, there is this um, expectation and the, the, the desire of uh, women researchers, many of them, to build a family and to dedicate some time of, the, of, of the, their life to this. And this is not always acknowledged acknowledged as, some, as something worth, uh, as something that uh, could actually uh, improve the quality of the research done by, by this person or this individual. And, uh, sorry. Yeah. Yes, uh, ju just on this on this matter of uh, family friendly policies. Once again, it's a generic term. Um, uh, just by the way, uh, uh, a lot of people, a lot of, of participants in the chat uh, mentioned that they would like to have uh, links, um, the links of the document that uh, uh, dear panelist uh, you you you've mentioned, uh, you've quoted. So uh, maybe you can share uh, at the end of this event some links. I will go. I will discuss on this uh, on this subject oh, with the organizer with the organizers because we don't have all the li the, the list of links. But that's a good point. Thank you, uh, Rosa and Ale Alexandra, for this uh, for these questions. And yeah. um, so, Emmanuel Royer, uh, can you give examples of actions pushed by the CNRS to help female scientists develop their international career without compromising their women's life? Uh, okay, so let me try to give a, an example, uh, knowing that, uh, okay, this is um, something we have to, to develop, but that already uh, exists. Uh, an important point in the career development of, of young people, of young women, seems to be the, the development of a network of international collaborators. Uh, and indeed, the CNRS has a set of international units in most in many countries in the world, for example, in mathematics, we have units in, in London, Rome, Vienna, Mexico City, Santiago, uh, de Chile, Rio de Janeiro, Vancouver, Montreal, Bangalore, and so on. So we encourage uh, our colleagues to, to spend six months to a year in, in these uh, international units. And of course, we do not want to limit this offer to colleagues with, uh, without children or who are prepared to be away from their families from, uh, from a long time. So it is necessary to accompany the, the children's schooling, for example, in a mm. foreign country. Let, let me mention that it, it could involve significant 
additional cost since uh, in France, uh, public education is essentially free and generally of, of good quality. Uh, the family travels uh, is also a big cost. And also, uh, we have to, to compensate for a possible loss of earnings for the, the partner who has to leave his job for six, six months to, to a year. So we have quite a whole system for financing the installation and life uh, on site uh, of a family assigned to a generous unit abroad. And of course, we actively encourage our uh, female colleagues to take uh, advantages of, of these schemes. Are these kind of initiatives, good initiatives, as far as promoting gender equality is concerned, uh, are, are these kind of initiatives discussed with uh, uh, other uh, uh, policymakers or uh, your eventually uh, some uh, uh, counterparts in other countries? Uh, um, do you discuss this at the, uh, with the European Commission? Is there somewhere, uh, <laughs> uh, you know? Um, uh, so no, no, not yet. Uh, I indeed, we, uh, okay, for, 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 for this action, uh, the, the French law allow us to, to do this uh, because in, in some sense, we, we, we nominate someone in the unit abroad and, and the law uh, is, is made so that we can, we, we can pay for the, the extra cost. Mm -hmm. um, okay, may, yes. May, maybe we, we could develop so some action, some international action to, to have more people uh, engage in, in this process. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, is it possible? Is here. Th th thank you a lot, Mr. Ray. Is it possible, Clement Amileva, to imagine that the European Commission develop international programs to help female scientists to develop their international network? Uh, it's not only possible, but uh, it is, uh, uh, we are working on it. But I just wanted to uh, maybe give you a, just a, a brief example uh, on the previous question about uh, um, how we can encourage women to participate more in the international projects, research projects, and in general to participate in research careers. I uh, mentioned already that uh, in the uh, European Research Council, we have special rules, which, which are uh, actually targeting uh, equal treatment for women and men alike, uh, because when, uh, when they when a person earns a grant for um, a number of years to do research, uh, their career, uh, th this grant will not stop because uh, the person has a child. Uh, for women, it's because they're um, in maternity up to 18 months, which for example, since we are in Belgium, in Belgium, it's just four months maternity leave. Mm. Uh, so, uh, and for, uh, for example, for men, this uh, translates into um, parental leave uh, and uh, including for adoption or um, um, the, the same applies also for adopted uh, in adoption. Uh, and what is more important is that actually this type of um, uh, policies work because there is what we notice that there is no difference in success rates of our applicants falling within the standard eligibility windows and those using these extensions. Uh, in no no uh, difference in the quality output. Uh, so I think that's a quite important uh, observation, and uh, maybe one uh, small um, uh, encouragement. Uh, uh, part as well from our uh, um, uh, research policy, policies, uh, I mean practice, uh, is that uh, in, in our new programs, specific activities promoting equal opportunities or gender balance, for example, let's say conferences or trainings or uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, similar events, uh, <clears throat> uh, they can be considered as eligible costs in the projects, okay. uh, independently of the of the uh, subject of the of the uh, project. Mm. 
Okay, so thank, I think that's thank, important. thank you very much. We, yeah. we only have five minutes for the end of this panel discussion. Okay. So, uh, uh, and there is uh, there's a lot of questions that I would like to ask, but uh, I will give a, a priority to uh, the, the chat. Um, can you comment about the possibility of having a more diverse vision of female scientists like uh, child, uh, child free women, uh, unmarried, single, aging? A few comments maybe on this, uh, on this subject. Who wants to to react? Question of uh, Genoveva Vargas Solar. Can you read this question, dear panelist? Uh, no, I no. So, I cannot read. But you, uh, I don't. Uh, I don't really uh, understand why we should make difference between uh, <laughs> child-free or, yes, or, why or should not child-free uh, okay. women. Uh, so they, they have to they have to be able to have uh, the same uh, options and the same opportunities. Uh, the, the answer is because there is no maternity leave. Ah yes, yes. But then uh, this is just uh, specifically done not to impede the the possibility of uh, mm. women uh, or parents. Let's put it this way to participate mm. in our project because. If you don't, uh, this is, if you don't have children, you are basically free to to do and to to compete on equal footing, um, or to work on equal footing, if you like, uh, with everybody. But you know, we have to kind of positive discrimination in this in this uh, sense. This, uh, okay, uh, Mr. Miss, Mrs. Almeida, you wanted to react. So just a, a little thought compared in, in the sense that um, Kevina was already uh, going. Uh, women uh, have uh, faced different de demands and the focus, the, the excessive focus on maternity um, put on the shadow other care uh, demands that they receive and they have to deal with. And so uh, it's important to understand uh, the opportunities, the circumstances. That's why we are advocating for a more um, balanced approach to evaluation, one that really uh, cares or, or take into account this, the, 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 the whole circumstance of the, the, of the researcher, if, I may, <laughs> if, I under, if I'm uh, making myself clear. Um, so it's important to take into account the multiple variables. You see, women are different. Everyone uh, has have to answer to these different demands in and with the resources they have, and the resources are limited as well and different as well. Okay, so, so yeah, that is why it's good to develop, uh, uh, you know, uh, meet career, you know, mentoring for uh, mid-career women, taking into account their reproductive and productive roles. Very important. Yeah. Okay, thank you for, uh, for sharing this, uh, this point of view, Mrs. Otibo. I think I have also uh, uh, another question. Uh, it's not a question, it's a, it's a point of view, but I'd like to share with it with you. As a woman researcher, Marie Bernadette said, as a woman researcher, I'm afraid to be in disagreement with the improvement of the mentality. Indeed, I got more direct offending sexist comments in the last five years than in the previous 30 ones. Looks like some of our male colleagues feel free to say things they would have never said before. Well, it's, it's, it's a point of view. I don't know if, it, if, you, had, if you have comments about this. It's, maybe, maybe it's a personal point of view. Of course, it's a personal point of view. But do you think it, it reflects the evolution on this uh, question of mentality. Can I say something? Yes. Uh, I wouldn't use the word evolution, but I'm sure that in some parts of the world, this is exactly what's happening. Because we know the, the political landscape and we know that some, um, some ways of thinking have, been, um, co have come to the surface uh, in a more explicit way uh, in some regions. So I, I, I'm sorry to hear that, but I, I do understand that many of our colleagues are facing this kind of uh, renewed, renewed misanthropism. Uh, 
<laughs> if I can make misogynism, I may say so at this point. Another point, a very important point, at, um, is uh, the question of the, responsi the responsibility that are given to, to women, uh, to scientists, women, female scientists. Uh, Thomas Berghofer, um, gender equality is also important, uh, as I said, at the, at the governance level. Uh, the question is often asked how to break the glass ceiling uh, according to you, and based on the discussion you had on the, on the Geneva network and the, the, uh, on the Geneva actions, uh, how to facilitate their access uh, to positions of responsibility in academic? Did you discuss this, this topic um, uh, in the Geneva? Yeah, yeah of course, we, we discussed it. I mean, it's important that we establish fair conditions for recruitment, for example. and. Um, so um, we also found an example coming from the Netherlands where uh, the director of an institute said to the committee, first, you have to actively search for females which may be considered for a position. So that uh, he wanted to have a list before this committee could start. So this gives, uh, this tells you something and then you have something in hand, people that you can directly invite or make uh, aware of, the, of an open position for example. And uh, what is also important are programs that are dedicated to support female scientists. So, so in Germany, we have the Professorin program, for example. This is all uh, working great. And uh, here you can improve the situation. Mm. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to take another question. Uh, like I said, I want to prioritize uh, the questions in, in the chat. Um, Pauline asked in the chat, while family-friendly policies are a good thing, uh, isn't there a risk that orientating them directly and specifically at women will only add to the idea that they should be the one handing all family care? That is a very good question. <laughs> I wish I'd, I'd ask, it, ask it. So who wants to answer and, or to comment? Mrs. Almeida, yes. No, no. Uh, uh, our colleague, yes. Mileva, please go ahead. Yes, I mean, I already mentioned that uh, this particular example of the European Research Council is not uh, uh, what, uh, what they have decided to, to put as a, as a top down approach to the, to, to the researchers, uh, to the grantees, is uh, oriented to, towards. Uh, I mean, both both parents. Huh? Okay, you have maternity, obviously, but <laughs> but uh, then you have an equal right as a father to participate uh, uh, through uh, through paternity leave, uh, and uh, also including including gay couples. They are even mentioned. This is even mentioned. So um, indeed, um, uh, what uh, the, the uh, comment uh, uh, how the comment was made indeed i would uh, would tend to agree that it, it can be um, this type of uh, positive uh, po positive policies could too much emphasize the the role of the woman as a you know burden care in the family physically in physical sense but on the other hand, uh, we need to start from somewhere to change the culture and look at the Scandinavian countries. Huh? They even have a sort of maternity leave for fathers. Yes, <laughs> it's, another, it's another world, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> equal time, I mean, for equal periods of like, uh, like women, they even obliged in some countries to share it. No, not, not, not uh, they are not, uh, allowed to decide, they're obliged to take it. So, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, depends on the focus. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, if I may add just a, a thought, is that uh, a, positive, a positive thought is that uh, we now talk about this as family policy, family friendly policies. This is an, an advance, you know, we didn't talk about this uh, before. So it's this, there is this really uh, uh, real effort to uh, take the issue in this perspective and not to make the, um, the, the policies uh, um, that are directed to women uh, be, to become a, a normative uh, 
uh, assessment of what the world should be, right? We are talking about um, trying to, um, to contain and to efface, to, to make disappear the obstacles or to fight the obstacles that women face, we do, we do not want at all to, um, yeah. to refight right, mm. those, those obstacles. Mrs. Otibo, and thanks. Is, yeah, and that is why, you know, UNESCO has uh, as two priorities global, which is priority gender and Africa. And the gender one, you know, which gives equal, equal opportunity to both men and women, uh, so that we can have a balanced family work, you know, uh, to be able to enhance it. Not only UNESCO, but the whole UN. So we pursue that. Where, you know, there's areas where you can also even have paternity leave, you know. So we recognize this and we're trying to look, you know, at that uh, uh, balance, you know, bringing about uh, gender equality in all that we do. Mm. Um Let's talk about for the last part of this uh, of this panel discussion. Let's talk about the the next challenges. Um, uh, what what is according to you? What could help uh, gender equality to to go uh, to go further? What are the the main points uh, that uh, we have to to work on? Uh, I, I don't know, Emmanuel Royer. Uh, as I said earlier on, uh, we really must have gender transformative policies globally, everywhere. We also need to connect men and women globally. And we have to start, you know, this policy from the playground to decision making. Well, how can we, we how, uh, that's, a, 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 thank you very much for your, for your comments, but uh, how can we organize this horizontal discussion between women and men, as you just said before. What is the good level of action? Is it local action? Do we have to count on uh, uh, the European Commission? Do you have to, to work with, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 research organism from in, uh, each country and create a network be between all these uh, uh, institutions to, to elevate this question? What is the good level? It, it's the same question that I asked before, sorry, but <laughs> I think it's important to, um, to address it. And I have no answer. Have a good uh, evening. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> who wants to answer? I don't know, T Thomas Berghofer, for instance, what would you recommend on this point? Do we have to create a, a, a new network from scratch uh, dealing specifically on this matter or do something exist? There are already mm. networks and we need to strengthen that. We need to work together. You know, as there are uh, too many networks. Do we have yeah. too many networks too on many this networks. on gender equality? A competition <laughs> oh, no. between them that can't make them go further. I mean, what shall be the goal? At the end, you want that gender equality plays a role in all the existing science networks, but this is not the case. And then this was why we, we found the Genera network uh, uh, itself uh, to on, on a specific field, physics. And uh, so our mission will be over if uh, maybe this gender equality has made it in all these uh, science networks, then we can close our door and I will turn off the light. So, but this is uh, maybe well beyond my retirement uh, when we go in the steps we, we are going now. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Uh, about, uh, speaking about uh, uh, Anais, uh, speaking about, uh, uh, networks, sorry, uh, Anais Libebe, uh, what is the fund for women in science community? Who is it for and how is it animated? It's, it's, a, it's an inspiring initiative, I think. Thank you, Mathieu. Um, the, so the, the for women in science community is not a fund, it's a, a, an app, a, a, a platform where uh, we gather all the alumni of the, of the for women in science program and the, the, this, um, this initiative, uh, has been decided because since the, the creation of the program, we, we had never really uh, followed up on, uh, on our alumni and 
aware of the importance of the network, as you, as you said, and also of the chance that we have to have this huge database of women scientists. We decided uh, to create this uh, for women in science community, which bring together all our, our alumni and also uh, allow us to create a powerful network of women scientists. And this uh, platform really um, allow us to connect our alumni and develop a global scientific network, but uh, allow also our alumni to collaborate with them, to share the experience, the research. We also, through this platform, animate and follow up on our community. We involve the, um, the alumni as ambassadors in the program. We develop mentoring, as Peggy said before, and uh, this platform is also a way for us to train uh, our alumni uh, on soft skills, uh, thanks to the work of uh, recognized coaches that we work with uh, on personal development, negotiation, and a lot of other topics. And uh, also thanks to a recent partnership that we developed with Coursera to give a certified uh, uh, training. Does this kind of network could exist, can exist, does exist, Kremena uh, Mileva, uh, at the at the European level? You know, um, a networks of uh, uh, women scientists, women uh, engineer, etc. Um, uh, there were uh, several projects which uh, encouraged this type of. Uh, <clears throat> networking uh, and uh, in the morning uh, my colleague spoke about uh, one of those this was gender gender sti so i'm not uh, going to speak about this now since we also don't have much time i just want to mention what are the future initiatives in that respect uh, now um, uh, we uh, have uh, uh, a project coming which will be um, organize, to organize Center of Excellence on Inclusive Gender Equality in Research and Innovation. Uh, the grant should be signed uh, this year already to, uh, and um, uh, the, the goal would be to, to, uh, to um, make this center even self-sustainable. Then we have uh, <clears throat> um, another uh, project coming up uh, also for this year to uh, set up a EU award for academic gender equality champions. Um, uh, so uh, this, this, uh, this should also encourage creation of a network. And finally, we are uh, having, uh, 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 we are organizing actually our uh, international cooperation directorate Together with the French, the French presidency is organizing a conference, and together with us, on um, uh, in Marseille in March, and um, actually uh, one of the focuses of this con conference uh, would be uh, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, women and gender equality, um, and uh, as a probably sort of a coincidence on uh, the first day of the conference, which falls on 8th of March, uh, and it's uh, the International <laughs> Women's Day. Uh, then it will, uh, we will organize a kind of a ceremony uh, to <clears throat> hang, uh, to, to hang the um, uh, prizes uh, of Marie Curie actions and uh, uh, the European Research Council uh, <clears throat> prizes for uh, women in science. Uh, hopefully, this will happen uh, live, <laughs> okay, <laughs> in person. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, there are initiatives, uh, and uh, um, we, as the European Commission, are very determined, actually, to to uh, work. Um, further uh, in extend our global approach uh, to include as well um, uh, gender equality and okay. uh, this would be just of one of the main steps we are taking now okay this is the end uh, in the few in a few minutes the end of this uh, panel discussion but i would like to ask thomas bergerfer um what is the future of the of the general consortium and uh, can it encourage uh, you know uh, the same kind of initiatives in other fields of research can we dream of a, a network of uh, networks of uh, 
the same kind of uh, uh, general consortium? Oh, <clears throat> the future will be, of course, bright for us. Or um, we are fully inclusively working network. The attention is great. We are gathering more and more interested uh, organizations. So and I think as long as we are addressing topics that are important for all of us, uh, so in the moment we are dealing a lot with gender dimensions in physics, which is, um, yeah, some people like it, some think it's, it's um, there is nothing about a gender perspective in physics, but um, well, I'm happy to share all the experience we made with our network with all others who, who like to do similar things. It is important that uh, you collaborate with social scientists who understand really the issue of gender equality. Just putting physicists together in a room doesn't make any change. Same may be true for <laughs> a room full of chemists or etc. So, um, so we are open and share all our experience and uh, look forward also to get hints from other networks like us uh, so that we can learn from others. So the, the continuous learning is important, I would think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Emmanuel Royer, uh, according to you, what could uh, help gender equality go further uh, at the international level? Uh, what can we do what could be imagined new networks or do we have enough networks no no no. we have to convince men to hire women um, oh, okay that, that, everybody uh, knows that <laughs> sorry but no no, no. okay the question uh, is how? yes exactly so we have to repeat uh, it so in practice uh, okay we have to train scientific leaders on on, on the stereoty stereotyping issues we have to push uh, to push communities to, to, do, do, to reflect. do they accept it? Sorry, Emmanuel Royer. Do yes. these senior researchers accept easily to be formed on this topic? And if they, are, if they do oh. not accept, should we force them to follow yes. this kind of, you know? Uh... Yes. 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 We have to. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I mean, we, we train uh, uh, scientific leaders to be managers. Um, so, yes, if they, they do not want to do it, we have to force them. So yeah. the question is how to, to force. Okay, yes. so the real question is how to force, but, uh, but we should. Um, uh, Peggy Efua Oti Boateng in uh, at phone for, for the, prepare, the preparation of this roundtable, you, you told me, uh, you told me, uh, that's a quote, we need men advocates of this question. We need encouragement. Yes, yes, we need men to encourage us at all levels. Our fathers, our brothers, our husbands, our friends, we need them to encourage us because you cannot afford to have half the population of the world not advancing at the rate in science. So we all need to work together and that's... To navigate this together. Thank you. And, and that's a very, uh, very good way to uh, finish uh, this uh, panel discussion. Uh, sorry, I had I, I, I had other question, hundred other questions. That's the, this is the end of uh, of our time. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to all our panelists. It's it was a real pleasure to have this discussion uh, with you. I guess it will inspire new initiatives for the future. And many thanks to all the participants uh, too. Your questions in the chat were very helpful. I leave you in the capable hands, the very capable hands of Florence Ranson, who will moderate the next panel discussion, the title of which is What Policy Levers to Promote Equality in International Cooperation? Hello, Florence. Thank you very much, Mathieu. Thanks for a, a really interesting and, and very uh, uplifting debate, I thought. Uh, you, had, uh, you had very good speakers, but also quite a lively interaction with the audience. So I hope we can reach that kind of level of interaction in our own panel. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, start uh, getting ready for your questions. 
Um, and, and indeed, um, we've heard a lot already about possible levers and possible approaches uh, in the first roundtable. So let's see how now we could use uh, the, the promotion of uh, equality uh, or how we could promote equality rather uh, through international cooperation as a policy lever. How can we use policy as an approach? Because after all, we've heard about several, uh, several um, suggestions in the previous debate, and we've heard about quotas, and we've heard about uh, the support of men being needed. And actually, my own personal take on that would be all of us should watch how we educate our boys, because that's where we all have to start. Um, as, as, a, as a boy's mom, uh, I can say that. Um, and um, I, I think that starting from all the uh, various ideas that we've heard in our uh, previous roundtable, um, we know that if we're going to use policy levers, that must be done at the highest possible level. So we know uh, that looking into uh, uh, this question is going to require uh, a broad bird's eye view from our speakers. And I know that they have it uh, thanks to their functions and their experience. And it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, our speakers for this roundtable, starting with Her Excellency Judy Wakungu, who is the ambassador of Kenya to France. Good afternoon, Your Excellency. Um, Delphine O, oh, who's also an ambassador and secretary general for the Generation Equality Forum at the French Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs. Good afternoon. We have with us as well uh, Rosa Menendez Lopez, who is the president of the Spanish National Research Council. Good afternoon. Um, and Muin Hamze who is the Secretary General of the National Council for Scientific Research in Lebanon. Good afternoon. Renu Swarouk. Um, Renu Swarouk is the former Secretary to the Government of India at the Department of Biotechnology uh, for the Ministry of Science and Technology. Good afternoon. And we have with us uh, as well, Dan Dutois, uh, who is the Deputy Director General in International Cooperation and Resources at the South African Department and Innovation. So we do have a very broad coverage, geographical coverage uh, this afternoon in this roundtable, and that is extremely um, valuable to us because I'm sure the experience that you will all share with us is going to take this uh, discussion to new levels. And I would like to invite you first, Your Excellency, uh, to take the floor. So are policy levers uh, a, a solution to promote gender equality and cooperation? Or is it feasible? Uh, thank you very much indeed to the organizers for inviting me to this very important uh, conference. I'm honored to be here with a distinguished panel, some of whom I recognized very well. Thank you also for this very important uh, question when it comes to gender equality in higher education or in research and innovation, and also the role of policies. Policies are of course key, they're extremely important. So policies must be developed first at the national level, and then also be implemented at the national and international level. At the international level, when it comes to gender equality and innovation uh, in international research, usually the first place to go to is bilateral relations. So looking at relations between countries. So for example, here I am representing Kenya in France, and indeed we have MOUs between our two countries, also touching on this very important topic of international research opportunities in higher education and also opportunities in innovation. You can extend these policies also to multilateral institutions. Again, because we're here in France, I can give you an example of the partnership that we have at the multilateral level with, uh, for example, UNESCO, 
when it comes to opportunities that have already been discussed by previous uh, speakers. Again, based on the strength of the bilateral policies and also based on the strength of the multilateral uh, policies. Policies are good, but policies must be implemented. It's not just good for policies to sit uh, on the shelf. So access to opportunities for working together in person on joint research projects that are mutually beneficial to the countries participating, to the institutions of higher learning participating, and also to the research institutions participating is also important. These policies can touch on many issues. For example, open access to information, sharing of equipment, opportunities for publishing, opportunities for participation in conferences. This allows us to share these diverse uh, perspectives. Let us also not forget the various international consortia. So for example, CNRS has convened, uh, has convened us uh, today. And again, participants today will also have that opportunity because the policies are in place to enable us to take back home what we have learned from this opportunity and implement this in innovation and in our uh, research. And let me just uh, conclude by saying, let us not forget that policies are not written in stone, particularly when it comes to issues of gender relations in innovation in higher education. We must be prepared to be dexterous enough to modernize and keep changing our policies to accommodate them to be more efficient under changing circumstances. I thank you for now. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Now, I should have now given the floor to uh, Ms. Mona Nehmer, who's the Chief Science Advisor to the Government of Canada. Unfortunately, Ms. Nehmer had to cancel her participation at the last minute due, a, due to a high level government engagement. And she was very sorry she could not be with us this afternoon. So she sends her apologies and we're sorry we cannot have her with us. But um, we have, in any case, uh, six speakers whose knowledge and experience is going to help us um, definitely make progress on, on that issue. Um, now, Delphine O, oh, um, have you ever used policy levers in order to promote gender equality in, in cooperation? Is that something that you have done or that you do on a regular basis? Um, thank you very much for the invitation um, and the participation in, in this panel and a uh, uh, friendly hi to uh, my friend Judy, <laughs> with whom I worked uh, with the implication of Kenya in the Generation Equality Forum. So um, I am the ambassador for gender equality of the French Minister of Foreign Affairs, but I also work at the multilateral level because I led the organization of the largest international conference for gender equality, the Generation Equality Forum, which took place last year in Paris uh, and in Mexico. And looking at you know, what works at the national and at the international level to promote the presence of women um, in science um, and in general in academia and in research, I think we have to look, as Judy was saying, at different levels, different levels of levers. First is obviously the national level. And I would say we have to use the legislative levers at some point. Um, I am a big uh, proponent of quota. Uh, and I know that quotas are still being debated. Um, I still don't understand how, how they haven't proved their efficiency uh, for everybody, as you know, uh, in another sector, which is the economic sector, uh, in the private sector, quotas in France have been in place for the last 10 years. They have proved their efficacy uh, for company boards. Now we're passing a new law when it comes to executive boards. Um, and um, I think that at all levels in academia and also in research institutions, we should make sure that there are quotas of women uh, in decision making making circles at, uh, at the decision making uh, table. Uh, but as Judy said, uh, when we have a policy or legislation that is in place, it needs to be implemented. We need to make sure also, and this is the second level, at the organization's level. So whether you're a university, a public institution, a research institution like CNRS, 
what are the specific measures that you have put in place to make sure that once uh, you have uh, hired graduates, female graduates from scientific fields, which we know are half of the graduates in scientific fields, how do you make sure they don't hit the glass ceilings once they start their professional career? We know all of the recipes. The recipes is to make sure that um, once they go into maternity leave, when they have a child, when they come back, um, they don't suffer a setback, but they actually get a promotion. In many private companies today, not only do women are women assured they would find their place when they come back, their position, but they actually get a promotion right after coming from maternity leave. How do we make sure that, especially uh, around the 30s, uh, when young women who have started their professional career start thinking about having children, they don't drop off? Uh, because uh, they don't see how they can um, reconcile their private and their uh, professional uh, life. Uh, you put in place a number of measures, specific measures to the institutions. Uh, we also need to make sure that these institutions provide paternity leave because if we want to be really gender equal, not only um, you know women and new mothers can take leave for their children, but if men also fathers take uh, paternity leave, which is as long as the maternity leave, then we're not gonna end up with an imbalance and with a gap in the professional career of women. And then the last level I would say is the partnership uh, slash international level. We have mentioned uh, in this panel, in this conference, a number of, of partnerships, coalitions, programs, consortiums, we know that work. I would like to mention the L'Oréal UNESCO for Women in Science program, which has been there for almost 25 years, which aims at raising the profile of outstanding women uh, researchers uh, in science and in different fields through the attribution of prizes. And we've talked about role models. We know that too few young female students who go into a scientific field, into a research, have role models they can look up to. Uh, you know, not everybody can be Marie Curie again. Marie Curie is a great example, but we have to remind ourselves not all of the female graduates, not all of the female scientists are going to be Marie Curie. 99.9% .9 of them are just going to be good uh, researchers, uh, good scientists, but they're not going to be as famous. They need also role models who are, I would say, average, normal people, not necessarily the unattainable role model like uh, Marie Curie. Uh, and we need to raise the profile of these women scientists uh, so that um, young students, even girls who are in primary, secondary school, then choose to go into the scientific uh, field. I could go on. I just wanted to uh, also uh, maybe highlight a fact that is uh, quite disturbing. How come, if you look at the uh, OECD statistics, how come um, there are 25% uh, women in South Korea in uh, higher education in science, 32% in France, and 55% in Tunisia? The numbers actually in the Arab states, which by many accounts working in the international arena are failing behind when it comes to gender equality, they are actually the most progressive when it comes to having women in scientific fields and in scientific careers. 48% in Algeria, 42% in Morocco, 43% in Oman, and again, 55% in Tunisia. So we have to ask ourselves in even the global north, countries like France or South Korea, uh, which are much more uh, gender equal in many ways, how come we have so few women, so how come female graduates or female students are being discouraged to engage in um, scientific or academic careers? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I, I could see that uh, Muin Hamze was getting ready to react, and I will ask you to react indeed uh, in, in a few minutes, because I'm sure you have some uh, comments to make on what uh, Delphine O just said. But first, I, I'd like to turn to uh, Rosa Menendez Lopez. Um, what is your own experience? How would you use policy levers? Uh, thank you, Florence. Thanks for this kind invitation. I'd like to talk from the experience of uh, my organization, the Spanish National Research Council, CSIC, and mainly focusing, let's say, on the internationalization and gender equality, you know, to show you our situation and the problems that uh, uh, we find. Our organization has experience 
study progress over the last 20 years regarding women's representation at all levels of the research career. And we have observed a progressive descent in the value of our glass ceiling index since 2002 when our commission for women in science uh, was established. However, despite the efforts uh, that we are making and the positive uh, trends obtained, the challenges ahead remain substantial. Uh, gender gaps persist in, in general terms, as you all are already mentioning, particularly when it comes to the leadership of international teams and projects. Our data regarding C6 participation in Horizon 2020 tell us that the average uh, women lead 32% of project teams and uh, the recipients of ERC have been 35%. Uh, regarding specific actions to improve the situation towards the future, I would like to stress the need to accommodate uh, women's reality to the design of public policies and programs, Judy has already mentioned. Uh, when it comes to international mobility, for example, uh, we know that uh, female researchers find their ways uh, to be mobile. They move internationally, but they move in a different way than uh, male peers. In Spain, we have the evidence that their international visits occur earlier in their careers. The visits, the stays are shorter and the destinations are located uh, closer uh, to home. You know, Simil similarly science studies inform us that scientific collaboration patterns uh, are gender. Women researchers are highly collaborative, but they seem to face more barriers than men to collaborate internationally. A deeper and broader understanding of these gender patterns, we think it is uh, essential. We need, uh, it has been also in the previous panel, refer uh, more inclusive policy uh, requiring adapting internationalization strategies to the reality of women's experiences. And the continuous increase of the women's participation in research is essential, in my opinion, to improve uh, female international collaboration and the integration of the gender dimension in research. Uh, if we have more women in the population, this will imply easier access uh, to homophilic collaboration networks, of course, and to female mentors and diversify role models. The SIC, uh, we have recently set up a new package of specific uh, measures to improve equality levels in recruitment and promotion processes and to support better work-life balance for uh, female researchers. For instance, we consider particularly important to provide proper training to recruitment and promotion committees. Committee members should know uh, why gender biases emerge and should have adequate tools uh, to prevent and fight against them. And finally, regarding innovation and the business sector, I am proud to say that our organization, uh, the SIC uh, women researchers are almost as active as men in the promotion of uh, high-tech startups. Uh, how can this be fostered in an international context is a question that I hope to find uh, an answer in this dis during these discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I don't know if we will find the answer, but we will certainly raise a few ideas. Um, and uh, Muin Hamze, I'm now turning to you. I will, of course, give you the opportunity to react to what uh, Delfino was saying, but also um, I'd like to hear uh, of your own experience in terms of uh, using uh, policy levers to promote gender equality. Thank you, ma'am. And um, concerning the policy 
all our institution in the whole Arab region, and I will, uh, I will highlight mainly the Arab region. Uh, we are in a permanent uh, exercise to establish policy and to adapt to policy to, uh, to the economical constraint, to the uh, new, new emerging uh, science and new emerging techniques. We end by having a policy in each country or even different policy, but all this policy in a country like Lebanon, Tunisia, Morocco, uh, Jordan, uh, Egypt are lit a little bit at a certain extent are the same. We are, we are having the same policies, targeting the same objective and very close to European uh, and Western policy for the same thematic. But Having a policy is not enough, it's not enough at all. Uh, a policy, the value of a policy is to have the enough resources to implement it. To implement a policy in a fair way, having equal opportunity to all human resources in the, in the society, I mean uh, man and woman, and even to all, uh, to marginalize the people in some country which represent a high ratio of the population. Uh, two points which deserve to be uh, developed at for to this uh, issue. Uh, the first one concerning the best policy is the one who can create an environment of trust, trust from the community. They trust this policy that this policy can help, can, can, uh, can help the development or can, uh, can have the, the, the trust of the community. The second one is uh, to, to implement a policy at any level, at any level, and maybe this is a specific of the Arab region. We need a political stability. If we don't have a political stability, all this policy huh, is bullshit. Uh, no one look at this policy and the priority in those country, in our country, in our region, Priority are, uh, is changing every month, every week sometime, and we don't know where to go, which kind of policy we have to update it. Uh, as, as concerning uh, what has been uh, mentioned by uh, Delphine, uh, first of all, I think you, you mentioned the program L'Oreal. We are involved in the program L'Oreal, and I'm today in Dubai. Yesterday, we celebrate the L'Oreal program in the Levant and, uh, and Gulf countries, and it was amazing to see the commitment of L'Oreal to support young women at the level of PhD student as well as postdoc. But what we need in, in an area where there is not enough support to the woman, uh, at least we need 50 or 100 L'Oreal program. L'Oreal program is still limited to a very limited, still uh, focusing on a very limited uh, number of women. Uh, of course, is excellence is the main criteria uh, to, to, to obtain the, 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 the prize or the awards from L'Oreal. But for the time being, this is the unique, almost the unique international, uh, international program to support and to empower women uh, in, uh, in all the world, and mainly we can see it in, in our region. Um, uh, if you want me to develop more about the situation in, in Lebanon, or I can, I can develop it later on, it's up to you, Florence. I think we can come back indeed to, to more specific examples okay. at a later yes. stage, just to make and sure that we have a, a tour de table to I start think, with, and we have be... heard everyone. Um, and I then we can be, we can come back to more useful, specific. If we can mention also the question of quota. Uh, quota yes, absolutely. But I mean, you know, feel, okay. feel free feel free to intervene whenever you want, uh, and just no, no, just no, raise your hand, you. and I give you the floor when okay. once we have done once we have finished our tour and everybody has had a chance to uh, present their views, uh, and then we can uh, I hope have as an in, as interactive a conversation as possible. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. So, um, um, now what policy levers could be used to promote equality in international cooperation? <clears throat> because we've heard a few examples and in the examples we've just heard in some countries, it is indeed 
uh, public policy levers that are used in other countries. It seems that the levers are more uh, supported by private initiatives. So what, what uh, in your view, is the best approach and, and what is your experience? Thank you very much, uh, Florence, and uh, thank you so much to CNRS for hosting this wonderful platform where we could share experiences of the international various examples of policies. And I think the key issues that are being discussed, as you rightly said, that there are policy levers which need to be used, but what's important is how do we institutionalize these? And I think for this, it's important that you have a generic agreement on what the key policy matters are, which are internationally agreed upon. But then you have national policy, uh, you know, pro which gets done because that would take into account a lot of social, cultural, behavioral, and other aspects, socioeconomic aspects. But most important is how do you implement these at the institutional level, at the organizational level? And I think here, if you look at it, Policies are important, but policies cannot be delinked from programs and most importantly from the people. Because if you have policies, they need to be implemented through programs. But for these programs, you need the right people. And those are the stakeholders that you were just talking about. It has to be an all inclusive stakeholder, which takes on the responsibility to work with everyone together to be able to implement this. These policies in isolation would just not mean anything at all. They would only be numbers. They would only be statistics that we would talk about. I think it's important for us to see that what is it that we really need to do to take these forward. Every country has its own uh, specific uh, manner in which they implement these policies. And we could go into more details, by example. But in some countries, like in India, for example, it's driven by the government. But while it's driven by the government, you do have complete participation of the private sector, of the corporates, to make sure that those policies get implemented at their level. But it's also important to see how those policies get translated to the grassroots level. Because for us, like in India, if the policy is not implemented at the grassroots and we do not take it to the to the uh, last mile where we have our population of young girls and young researchers, the policy again would not really mean anything. So there we have to work, it's a federal structure, we have to work with our state governments, but we have to work with NGOs and with other groups who can help us to implement it at the ground level. I think key aspect here is what really are those policy levers? Is it just looking at policies which allow an excellent working environment or is it policies which allow for the empowerment and the and the building the leadership i think for us what we have seen is it's key that we bring in policies which help us to start from the base because we do talk about numbers being important we do talk about having very few women at the top but it cannot be an inverted pyramid we must have a very strong base. So our focus is on developing policies in partnership with all stakeholders to see how we build a very strong base of education for girls at the, at the grassroots level. Try and empower them, create those important policies, and then through those higher education uh, programs that we take on, we build in the leadership. Once we build in the leadership, we build a strong foundation we then try to see how we empower them with different aspects, whether it's research programs or working through our numerous international partnerships that we have. Bilateral, multilateral, consortia, all spoken about here. But I think, again, the key aspect here is how do we bring in the international best practices to the policies that we're implementing? Here again, while we do have programs that we implement through these bilateral partnerships, but I think it has to become a part of the international agreements that we bring in. Because unless and until it becomes a part of that international agreement, they are not institutionalized. And I think those levers then give us the actual results of how we take it ahead. Currently, we have been talking about collaborative research programs, which allow for the participation of women 
to help empower them, to help strengthen their science, research, technology, innovation capacities and capabilities. But I think there needs to be more focus on trying to see how we can also look at partnership programs to help the girl education activities, to try and see how we allow more mobility programs for exchange of scientists and students so that that becomes part of our uh, main aspects that we look at. It's also important for us to see, as I said, that it's an all-inclusive policy where we bring in all the stakeholders who are engaged in these sort of activities for us to move forward. In these international policy levers that we talk about, we have looked, seen, and it's been very helpful, where we've done these bilateral or trilateral agreements where the science academies in every country, they have been leading the program on gender equality. If they have a common agenda on which they work, this helps us to then build. India has done many such programs of trilateral, multilateral, where we've seen a participation of different organizations coming ahead. I think the other aspect which I would like to highlight here. If I could ask you to do so, I'm sorry, if I could ask you to do so briefly, just so that we can continue, you know, we don't lose the momentum of the exchange. So I think the key point that I would like to mention here is that it has to be all inclusive to be able to see that we bring in all stakeholders without pointing only on the government or the private sector, and also ensuring that in countries like India and other parts where we do have different stakeholders who work at the grassroots level, their engagements also become important in policies that we make sitting in the ministries and the government levels. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Dan Dutois, uh, what what do you think? Because we, we've heard about we, we've heard about institutionalization of the levers. We've heard about the implementation of policy at grassroots level. Uh, we we heard about uh, quotas. We we will come back to quotas. Um, there have been a, quite already quite a few ideas thrown into the debate. What what are your views? Thank, thank you very much, Florence, and indeed, thank you very much to CNRS for inviting me to participate in this discussion. This discussion is crucial for South Africa. The fight against exclusion, against inequality is what we are as a country is all about, given our history, and we're determined to work for equality and inclusion. Those are values enshrined in our constitution. We're also a country which is deeply committed to and believes in the value of science and innovation to make a difference in our society. To, uh, to improve the quality of living of our citizens. And we also believe that science progresses through international cooperation. So gender equality in science is an absolute policy priority for the South African government. And that is not only to ensure that we have a research and innovation agenda, which is gender sensitive, but also as other speakers have said, that we ensure that we draw on the huge and the immense capabilities of all from all excluded uh, components of the scientific workforce. And I should say, and as other speakers have mentioned, that when we should look at gender, when we look at gender equality, we cannot do that in isolation of the broader intersectionality context. So from a South African perspective, it's very important that our policy intervention should be based on key principles. And there are four of those I would like to outline. First of all, it, it should be, as Ambassador Wakungu said, it should be an integral part of our national science policy. It, it shouldn't be something which stands alone. It, it should be at the heart of uh, gender sensitive and, and, and focus on gender equality should be at the heart of the national research and innovation policy. But in secondly, we all know in the policy domain that often if you don't want to do something about something, you want to mainstream it. And you say, no, this will be mainstream. So at the same time, you, you have to be deliberate and you have to be specific. The third principle I would say is you have to be sustainable. You have to have the long-term perspective. We know that the inequalities, the exclusions which have been caused is a result of, of of centuries uh, of, of, of our history. So it's very important for policymakers to sustain the commitment to these objectives across different governments, for example, and ele electoral cycles. And then fourthly, as others have mentioned as well, our policy intervention should be evidence-based. We need to consistently look at the data, qualify the assumptions we make about whether things have improved or, or, or not improved. So monitoring and evaluation is absolutely crucial. So then just to conclude within that area, we believe that the intervention is needed policy intervention and impact is needed in three areas. It's at a national level. So for example, we have very strict rules that when we engage with international partners, um, our delegations should be uh, completely gender equitable, so to speak. 
Um, when South Africa engages on global platforms, when we present the face of South African science, we should be sensitive to the country we represent, including with, uh, with regard to gender. And then we have proactively invest. We invest in seed funding, specifically focused on young female black scientists who do not have access to the international networks they perhaps older male peers have to access those opportunities. We speak here within the context of the European programs. We know the key to success to participate in Horizon Europe is access to international networks. So unless you proactively invest in supporting international networks, you will not have um, gender equality in participation. But then we, we also have to, to, to negotiate with our, nat our international partners. And I think this is where it gets more tricky because as the old saying goes, it takes two to tango. So we sometimes find opposition if we want to include, and we are not ashamed to use the word quotas or other specific clauses in our programs because there are some of our partners who would not agree with those. So what we, for example, would often do is to say, where South Africa has to fund participation in international programs, we will say that we will only fund consortia of South African um, researchers if they do take into consideration into consideration our policy considerations such as gender equality. And I think just a third point, as my good friend, uh, Dr. Peggy from UNESCO said, we are very determined to work within UNESCO, within the African Union and all pol other policy, global policy frameworks to work for the advancement of the gender, gender equality. Because you, we, 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 we do need, we do need to interrogate and we do need to disrupt the, the policy thinking and policy regulation at a global level. Thank you, Florence. Thank you very much. Right, so we have set the scene and we've already touched upon quite a few themes that I'd like to come back on. Um, and, and maybe I, I will start with, um, with the regulatory and legal perspective, uh, because for many of you from what we've heard, that is where it all starts. We'll come down maybe to the implementation part later on. Um, but from a legal and regulatory perspective, um, how possible is it really to include provisions on gender equality in international cooperation agreements? Um, Delphine O, is it possible to really go for it and, and demand that dimension? Um, it demands, it, it, it depends what you mean by international cooperation. Uh, do, you, do you mean, um, you know, voluntary collaboration or voluntary cooperation between public institution and research institutions? Or do you mean, should we go as far as imposing quotas uh, to these institutions? There's no international legal framework or international legal instrument as of today that is um, in capacity to impose, for instance, a quota uh, or um, yeah, a numerical quota to research institutions. Uh, UNESCO is obviously the UN agency, the international organization which is in charge of overseeing um, uh, the, the, the sectors and the area of research and education, but it has no power uh, as of today with the international conventions existing on higher education to impose a quota. So it's all based on a voluntary uh, basis. Um, I think it could be an idea, you know, that a, a small consortium starting small, but then growing big of international higher education or international research institutions decides freely, voluntarily to self-impose uh, quotas of uh, women in uh, recruitment, in hirings, in decision-making bodies, in uh, the board, and so in the executive committee and so on. And then uh, we would uh, hope for a positive uh, snowball effect. Uh, I'm not an expert of uh, the, the you know, academia research. I work in gender equality across the board, uh, but I've seen how uh, when um, there is no legislative or regulatory constraint, uh, to impose parity, uh, then uh, goodwill and uh, the fact that some uh, of the organizations of the area, of the sector, uh, start uh, with initiative and lead the way will then um, lead to others uh, following up uh, just because they don't want to be seen uh, sort of lagging behind in that area. Right, um, but that, that kind of builds into what uh, Dan Dutrois was saying earlier about the fact that when South Africa wants to include such provisions in some agreements, uh, you, you sometimes face a, a wall, don't you, uh, Dan Dutrois? I mean, it, you know, you, you said yourself that you yes, had sir. to impose at yeah. some point. 
I mean, Florence, when you when you asked the question about whether it's impossible, I couldn't help but think of the the, the words from one of the founding fathers of our democracy, um, our former president Nelson Mandela, who said it's only impossible till it's done. So the fact that it's impossible, the fact that it's difficult doesn't mean we shouldn't work for it. So this, uh, it, it, will, it will not be easy. I can agree completely with, with everything Delphine said, but it means an ongoing effort, a consistent dialogue. And I think it's important that all of those, and I include myself, those within the, in the policy making positions, we then honestly interrogate ourselves the questions, why do we need to do this? And, and we need to do this not only because it's the right thing, but it is because it's essential that we do that, because we are not going to and least the potential of science to make the qualitative difference in the world we all speak about and which we want to do if we continue to have practices and we continue to have programs which exclude and discriminates against a, a significant part of the scientific workforce. So, so it, 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 it's a long-term effort, but it, 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 it should be done. And I think it's about being creative. It's about, uh, it, it, it's about uh, find, finding solutions which, which um, can, can demonstrate the results. I mean, we for just one quick example, we, our equivalent of the European Research Council is a program called the South African Research Chairs Initiative. And for many years, that was completely dominated at the success rate by male applicants. Still our former minister, Minister Pandor, who many people would know, actually challenged us and said the next call will strictly be reserved by, for female applicants, but nothing will change. All the criteria, et cetera, will be the same. And, 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 and the call was completely oversubscribed, which I think just was clear evidence about how the, the system is still inherently discriminatory and therefore we, we need concerted actions to, to change it, even if it seems difficult. So Renu Swarov, that builds into some of what you said because you, you insisted very much upon the uh, grassroots effect and the fact that if you have laws or if you have regulation of some kind or some obligation of some kind, it has to be implemented at the grassroots level. But what brings the, uh, the, the policy levels, the policy makers to make those decisions, to impose uh, those uh, obligations onto their partners or, on, or into their regulatory system or is that, is that something that you have experienced? Uh, so Florence, it's not easy to impose it on your partners, but this always does work out very well through a dialogue that you can have of mutual cooperation with your partners. And again, I think what is important in these uh, international agreements, and as has been rightly said, it's not impossible to include it into the agreement. If there is a generic agreement on what your key principles are of what you would want to achieve with gender equality. If you would want to make sure that you have the gender equality, and then as a part of that, one of the key programs that you bring in is to see how you build that leadership how you create those numbers, because if you put in a quota and say, okay, X percent is what we would agree as per this international agreement, no country or no partner would want to compromise on quality and merit. So you do need to have enough numbers to come forward to be able to accept it. And I think that is something partners always agree upon in trying to see how you could build that whole uh, leadership or build that strong base. And if these sort of mutually agreed parameters are, are brought onto the table, they can form a part of the international agreements that we sign. And it depends country to country, it depends between partners, how you could mutually agree on these aspects which you want to take forward. Your Excellency Wakungu, what, what do you think uh, are the main drivers that a government can use in order to promote gender equality in these international uh, dialogues? So, you know, we, we, we've talked about the fact that imposing from the top can also be an approach. So how, how should governments go about it? What drivers can they use? Um, there are many drivers that can be used. For example, with Kenya, first of all, I agree with the previous uh, speakers on the question that you, you um, posed earlier. There are many drivers that you can use. For example, in, in, in Kenya, we have the constitution of Kenya. And the Constitution of Kenya has various articles and guidelines on the various sectors, including our responsibility for gender equity. Now, when we sign international agreements, MOUs, these ideally ought to be in tandem with the Constitution of Kenya. So for example, we have 
a regulatory framework for gender participation uh, in various fields. Now, ideally, this should also be reflected in the international agreements. Where it becomes very difficult is always implementing them. But if, say, we have an international agreement, uh, a convention, for example, and Kenya ratifies that convention, then that also becomes part and parcel of the laws of Kenya in which we must abide. And so if those statutes are included in those agreements, then we have a mechanism that legally, and we're legally bound to use that mechanism. Now, do we always do it? No, but they are ways and manners using our legal instruments, our regulatory frameworks, and at the highest level, our constitution to enable us to achieve these goals. Thank you. Thank you. Delphine O, oh, would, would you agree with that approach? I mean, you mentioned earlier on the, the, the French example and the fact that in the uh, economic sector, uh, quotas have worked very well, for instance. Uh, is, that, uh, is that something that uh, can work at uh, or in, in scientific circles? Um, is that the kind of obligation that could be required of trade partners or uh, what, what's your view on that? Well, as I said, you know, I'm a big proponent of quota. And uh, if, if you look at the issue of quota, which is still being debated again, um, 10 years ago, when the law passed in France, which imposed a 40% quota of women in company boards, um, almost the entire private sector, all of the CEOs who are mainly male, were against it. Um, and their main argument was to say, there were two arguments. One argument was to say, we don't have the women, they're not there. Uh, we don't have, you know, the competent women uh, who, with the experienced women uh, whom we could nominate to the company boards. And second um, argument was to say, you should uh, sort of <laughs> let the flow go. Uh, you should not impose from a top-down approach, but you should let the bottom up work. Um, and we will come to that um, result, but you should not legally constrain us. 10 years down the lane, if you interview uh, CEOs who have been there for 10 years, uh, if you interview uh, the CEOs of the, of the CAC 40, the 40 biggest uh, uh, French companies, they would all, without exception, say that law was great. We were wrong at that time. Uh, we recognize that without the law, we may have reached that goal, but in 100 years, not in 10 years. And we would never, never in, you know, in the world come back, go back on that law. Uh, and now we have 43% women in company boards uh, in French companies. And this has proved also not just, you know, a rights issue and equity issue, but also a performance issue. And I think this is also what the higher education and research world need to know, and I'm sure they know it, this is also a performance issue when you have more parity uh, and more women at all decision-making bodies, and when you have also more women in science and you make sure that they can reconcile our private and professional life. So this is what I would say if anybody's against quotas. Um, and and I, yes, I, I think there should be uh, you know, some thought leaders uh, who are ahead of that time and self-imposed uh, the quotas and sometimes um, you know, if uh, some of the organizations take the lead without the legislation being there in place, then the legislator follows up uh, sometimes and then decides to vote a legislation uh, once the model has proved to be efficient. This is also a way to go instead of starting with the legislation and then uh, imposing it on uh, the different organizations. Yeah, it can actually probably become a competitive advantage in some cases in terms of image of uh, certain companies, for instance, the way they uh, promote sustainability, they could also very much promote uh, equal opportunities in their boards and so on. So uh, indeed, that's probably been part of the, uh, of the extra pickup uh, for those who went beyond the law or who anticipated the law. Um, Muin Hamze, um, the, the, the quota words has been mentioned, actually. So do you think um, 
is that one of the expectations that uh, research organizations have towards their governments, towards their ministries, uh, in order to help them in implement gender equality policies? Do they expect uh, incentives? Do they expect quotas? Uh, what, what's, the, what's the position of uh, research organizations? Uh, you know, you need, to, you need to unmute yourself, Maureen. Oh, sorry. It's okay now. Can you hear me? Yes, with uh, Rosa, Rosa, we can, Rosa. but I, I will turn to Gwyn first and then I will come to you. Is that okay? Okay, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, in, in different occasions, we are mentioning that uh, the, the ratio of uh, female in science, technology, engineering, and medicine study are higher than, uh, than men. This is uh, true. And sometimes we can talk about feminization of the higher education and even of the research in most of the Arab country. I'm talking about uh, Lebanon, Jordan, Gulf country, even Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia. This is a positive thing, but we have to recognize that uh, this high ratio doesn't necessarily translate the representation in the workforce. Uh, if I give the, the example of Lebanon, Lebanon, which is ranked 132 uh, in the World uh, 2021 Global Gender Gap Index, uh, women are uh, rep represent in, in the workforce in Lebanon, uh, not more than 25%. So quantitatively speaking, in the scientific field, women represent, in fact, 60% of PhD. And most of this PhD program are uh, established in co-advisory and co-tutel on international program with European and uh, Western University. 32% Unfortunately, 32% of researchers and only 20% of deans are women. So there is a leaking in the system, and, uh, we, and we cannot say that there is not enough competence among, uh, among women uh, to, uh, to excel in, uh, in key position. In the contrary, the experience uh, we can say it during the three last decade where I was responsible for uh, universities and for the scientific research, I can say that uh, women can obtain the trust of the international cooperation uh, quickly and they can act on uh, according to the, uh, to the code, according to the rules, to ethical, deontological rules, and we never mentioned any corruption as we can heard in, uh, at the level of women, which is very encouraging to give them some responsibility. The main, the main constraint, not women are obtaining uh, their right to have uh, equal opportunity as men is lack of education in decision maker. Our decision maker, are not educated enough, and we are counting on international program, international program to boost and to give more opportunity for a project, uh, for a project dedicated and for incentive dedicated for women. As for the question of quota, I I would like to say that quota, quota itself is is questionable. Uh, if we look around us. Many countries took some measures such as imposing quota at the highest academic level or, or in the evaluation committee. But the finding, the finding and the results is not in favor of giving more opportunity to women. And sometimes there is some studies in nature on others uh, saying that when the evaluation committees are shared by women, women are not are not very well treated or are not getting the same treatment as men okay but all of this is uh, is not significant for uh, to establish and to conclude a theory but i would like to mention the very complicated situation uh, in lebanon 
if the quota is not implemented at the political level, and I repeat at the political level, it will never be implemented at the academic and scientific level for different consideration. So we should start by the top. It is at the political level, which will give equal opportunity for the economy, for, entrepren for entrepreneuria, also as well for uh, other uh, productive sector, and of course, for academy and research center. All higher positions in Lebanon are distributed according to confessional, political, and even geographical quota. Huh? You understand that we have three quota, confessional, political, and geographical, regional geographical quota. And it's already very complicated. Adding another quota, I believe, will not help in improving women's representation in the scientific ecosystem unless, and I repeat it, unless a political and institutional reform at all level is done. Uh, I would also say that- Thank you. I, I, yeah, I, I okay. think we can, we can come back to you uh, in, in a few minutes uh, on, on, on uh, that particular point. It's true that Lebanon has probably a rather, uh, is probably in a rather particular situation, but uh, uh, to, to, to pick up on the question of, of quotas and, uh, and, and the difference between, um, uh, or, or rather the expectations of uh, research institutions towards their ministries, uh, I'd like to, to come back to uh, Rosa Menendez Lopez uh, because clearly you mentioned in your introduction some of the uh, measures that you have already taken. So what, what do you expect from your ministry? If you, if you had your minister just there, what would you say uh, to him or her? Uh, and what would you expect in terms of incentives uh, or, or quotas or anything else? Uh, we are already working with our ministry, you know, uh, is, there is a, quite a large uh, commission where the different uh, ministries participate, okay, and also research organizations, and uh, we are happy that some of the actions that we have already taken are, let's say, taken into consideration uh, by the ministry. We don't have in real implementation in the policies, as you already mentioned, that uh, uh, could help. But it, I think there is a strong movement. We have now, by law, that uh, when a female scientist or a male uh, are taking care of the kids or senior people, this period will not be considered for the evaluation of the curriculum vitae. It's not uh, very much, but it's a starting, you know, point uh, to consider uh, specific uh, actions. And of course, um, it's not uh, our case is that it's not written, but we have been applying for years uh, panels uh, uh, with 50-50 in most of the cases for the selection and the evaluation of the people. I would like to tell you that we have some male scientists that the, there is not a, a paritary composition of the panel. They do not participate. So this uh, atmosphere is clear in the organization and the actions are being specific, is very specific in mentoring, promoting, going to the schools, teaching, you know, even the teachers, you know, how uh, from the primary schools, the kids uh, need uh, must grow up, uh, not looking at uh, seeing, you know, the capabilities of the persons and not only, you know, astronauts or whatever, just uh, men. And looking at quotas, I would like to show you an example, you know, I, it has been quite a number of years ago, I started working for the Commission, European Commission as evaluator. I was trying to remember if it was the fourth or fifth framework program. It was when the, the period of the inter integrated projects in networks of excellence. 
I must confess that if not, it was not by the quotas. At that time, it was 40% uh, female, I remember, in the panels, in the evaluators. I am pretty sure I would never go, maybe you never know, uh, to Brussels. And I've been working with the commission in different panels and organizing many things for years, different framework programs. And I am pretty sure that the quotas were, def were definitive at that time. So about quotas, I would say it depends. In some cases where the feel of the situation is close, absolutely, I am in favor of the quotas. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I actually like your, your example of uh, uh, men not participating in panels if they are manals, as we, as we call them. Uh, that would be very interesting to see applied here in Brussels, uh, where manals continue to be the norm, unfortunately, in too many events. And that isn't the case today in this uh, conference, and it's, and it's great. Um, so, we we have uh, we have looked at a few at a few tools that are at at the disposal uh, of of the various stakeholders. Um, can can international cooperation, as such, um, help improve gender equality in your own organisation? Uh, maybe I'll start with you, uh, Renu Swarup, on that particular question. W would you say that international cooperation agreements? has helped or helps still does improve the uh, the gender equality approach in your own organization uh, thank you florence that's a very important question and i think uh, yes i will say it has uh, the government of india as i said has a large number of partnerships with many countries both bilateral multilateral the way it helps is it helps us to look at the key principles of gender equality on a, on a common platform, bringing in the best practices from the other organizations to yours. It also helps us through bringing in many a times a level of competition to say, well, how can we strive to achieve that level of excellence, which is already existing? And thirdly, it also helps us to bring to a common platform the key and critical issues, which then, as I said, through this policy, uh, agreements help us to implement those programs which allow access to uh, more resources, both in terms of financial, human, and access to large mentorship pools which come in through these international agreements. So international agreements, cooperations are very important as are national partnerships to implement these gender equality programs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what about you, Dan Dutois? Is is that the case in your own organization? Def, def, definitely. I mean, why do, we, do, why do we collaborate internationally? Why do we engage in international policy dialogues with partners? Because we learn from each other, we share experience, we share expertise, and then and that serves as a, as a tool to challenge ourselves. And, and there are many, many examples where we've been inspired or, or guided by the experiences from some of our international partners. Or sometimes, on the other hand, it, uh, we are also confronted with situations which, which sort of reminds us of from where we've come from and from which we've moved away. So, I mean, and that applies to all policy domains in science. International engagement is absolutely critical. Uh, I mean, our 20 years ago, um, when we first established a national reference panel um, to advance women in science and address gender imbalances in research, we were very much assisted and guided by the then nascent Women's in Science program of the, of the European Commission. And, and, and it's one of the reasons South Africa is very committed to and participate in international forums and support the programs of the likes of UNESCO, the Organization for Women in Science in the Developing World, et cetera. So, so, so it's absolutely crucial. Thank you. And what about your uh, own experience of that, Muin Hamze? Uh, has has uh, the fact that you had international cooperation agreements helped improve gender equality in your organization? You need to unmute yourself. Sure, the international program, they, when, when we are part of the European or even bilateral program, uh, we have to respect their code, we have to respect their rule, and we always say that there is a rule 
to to give equal opportunity for for men and women and we appreciate this and i think this is it was always a good example to follow at the national level uh, international program has helped us a lot in dismantling stereotypes which negatively affect the educational and vocational vocational choices of female of female in scientific research and in development and it helped it helped us in formulating and implementing uh, some, some charter some charter for a, a better for uh, for the management of our program and for the management of our institution i think there is international program where we can benefit from it but there is not enough international program dedicated to support the cause of women in a country where they don't they don't represent a higher ratio in the uh, in key positions we need such a kind of program we always mention this to our partner in europe and in in uh, at the european union level and i think so far still very very moderate reaction uh, a very moderate reaction and i understand why they are uh, they are not in favor 100% of establishing such a program because they uh, they know that there is some religious and social constraint for the arab woman in our region which is which will not make it easy to any uh, international approach the implementing of a uh, an updated strategy in support of the woman situation need to be accepted by the beneficiary and we cannot guarantee that it will be accepted but let me clarify one last point i'm in favor of the quota i'm in favor of the quota we are applying the quota huh? 50 50 we are applying the quota at our level but this is not sustainable to be sustainable quotas should start by the political level then economical level then it will come to the academic and the research institution thank you so <clears throat> Um, Ambassador Wakungu, we, we have talked about the regulatory aspect, the uh, cooperation agreement aspect. What, there's one dimension we haven't touched upon yet, and that is civil society and NGOs um, mm -hmm. and, and organizations like women's associations, for instance. How can they help improve the integration of the gender dimension uh, in, in research, uh, whether through the uh, sustainable development goals or, or, or other uh, other approaches, what, what role can they play? They are absolutely important, and I'm very glad that you've actually posed this question. They are absolutely essential when it comes to the issue of civil society and when it comes to the issue of NGOs, because they co constantly challenge uh, the checks and balances of government policies. And anywhere where they see that there is perhaps discrimination, they are very vocal about it and they're becoming more vocal. If I look at the Kenyan example, if I look at the East African example, this also then moves into the international component. When I look at the issue of women in science and engineering, or well, let me just say women in STEM, the civil society and women's organizations, the Association of Women in Science, for example, Women Engineers uh, Program, awards like the award uh, program which promotes the role of women in agriculture and also looking at the L'Oréal UNESCO program has allowed women to be noticed, has allowed women to receive uh, funding and has also forced organization or let me say encouraged organizations to make sure that as at the higher echelons women are also more represented and therefore having some gender equality. They're absolutely critical. When it comes to the inefficacy of certain laws, for example, these institutions have also been extremely important. From the women's component, many of these organizations have trained women lawyers so that they are able to propose new laws and that those new laws are actually accepted. Absolutely important, I'm glad you uh, you posed that question, and for, and for Kenya, it has changed the dynamics 
of gender in our country, and it will continue to do so. We've got a long way to go, but it continues to have an impact. Thank you. Delphine, oh, is that something that you've also noticed in your own experience, the really crucial role played by NGOs and uh, civil society at large, women's associations? Yes, absolutely. And this is exactly the kind of work, um, creative work we're trying to do with the Generation Equality Forum, which I mentioned in my introduction. So this uh, large international conference um, organized by UN Women and co-hosted by the governments of France and Mexico, which took, class, uh, took place uh, last year. Uh, we tried to change the, uh, the rules of the diplomatic game. So usually when we talk about uh, international cooperation, we actually talk about inter intergovernmental cooperation or intergovernmental negotiations together with international organizations, usually uh, the United Nations, but it's also the OECD or other regional organizations. What we did last year, very interestingly, is that from the very onset of this conference, you know, two and a half years before it was actually scheduled, we brought on board um, the NGOs, the feminist organizations, the large ones, as well as the grassroots organizations, uh, the development uh, civil society organizations um, and we um, you know we we didn't have a quota but we actually included them at the decision making table so that for two reasons the first one is that these civil society organizations have the expertise on the ground uh, they are the closest to the reality of what women face around the world uh, when we talk about uh, um, you know, equality in the professional world, uh, gender pay gap, but also, of course, uh, uh, gender-based violence and other uh, uh, gender equality related uh, issues. Or even we could talk about uh, sexual harassment and gender-based violence also in academia and research institutions and scientific careers, because uh, unfortunately no uh, sectors or no uh, career is uh, deprived from, uh, from gender-based violence and sexual harassment. So what we did is that we included that at the table to get Together with government representatives such as myself and the UN representatives. We also included at the table, and I want to go back to where our colleague from India was saying, the private sector. So we had companies being represented, we had also philanthropic foundations being represented because today uh, they're one of the major funders and donors to gender equality around the world, including on very hard topics such as uh, gender and climate or sexual and reproductive rights and gender-based violence. Uh, and we had everybody around the table. It was a huge challenge to have everybody agree on the roadmap for gender equality for the next five years on actions and programs and funding. But we made it in the end. Um, the, the downside to this is that not everybody agrees to be sitting at the table of civil society organizations and especially feminist organizations that uh, are sometimes more radical than any other kind of civil society organizations. And so uh, we, but we're lucky that we have governments, of course, from the global north, but also from the global south. And I want to uh, salute the government of Kenya, which was uh, definitely one of the regional leader and world leader on this issue, uh, but also other governments for instance in uh, Latin America we had Argentina we had Costa Rica uh, we had um, Chile uh, Rio Uruguay uh, in Africa we also had Ethiopia Burkina Faso Malawi South Africa also want to salute the government of South Africa and, and Minister Pandor who is very active uh, in this issue uh, and also in the Middle East and, and Asia so definitely uh, it's worth uh, bringing on board and in this particular area of, of um, gender equality in, in the university, I think, uh, as women's associations, uh, you know, women's associations such as uh, Mission Femmes CNRS, but also uh, the other ones in the different sector and academic field need to be on board because they're the first to receive the, the voice of women and hear the voice of women. Thank you. Dan Dutois, um, uh, your government has just been mentioned as, as an example. How, how do you see the, the, the role played by uh, NGOs and civil society at large in, in the evolution as far as your country is concerned? Well, absolutely a, a crucial role to play. I mean, they, they have to keep us uh, on our toes. They, they have to fulfill the the, the watchdog ro role. I mean, one of the things we've done, which I think has really helped, is that um, within the South African public service, 
all government departments have to compile what is called annual performance plans, which get scrutinized by our parliament and on which civil society can comment. So for example, in the plan for which my program is responsible, we've got very specific targets, both from an output and an, out and an outcome um, perspective on how we seek to advance gender equality in science. So, so it, has to be a, it has to be a collective effort. Um, there has to be the open dialogue with civil society. Um, and it, it's really the, for these key societal challenges, um, it, I mean, we, we like to say in South Africa, Team South Africa. So it, it, it should be that united approach. So it's, it's not, it shouldn't be a confrontational one. I mean, if, 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 if confrontation is necessary, this show it should be, but it's really about working together. It cannot be left to governments alone. That, it, that is for certain. Nenu um, Swaru, what, uh, what about India? Has, has uh, or have NGOs and uh, has civil society uh, managed to make the, the government accountable for progress made uh, or not made on, on equality issues? Uh, so as I said uh, right in the beginning, Florence, that this is uh, gender equality is an issue which it has to be all inclusive. We have to work with all stakeholders. Whether the NGOs and the civil society have made the government accountable or not is a different issue, which we may not have immediate indices or parameters to be able to bring out data on. But I think what is key and crucial is the government's policies, which get done by the government, as I said, are to a great extent at the grassroots level being implemented by the, uh, by the NGOs and those who are looking at bringing in a lot of higher education programs for the young girls. And I think that's where our base of their participation is. But even in our s &T programs in the academic institutes in the private sector, there is an all-inclusive approach where we try to work with everyone to see how we can implement it. The government alone cannot implement such an important policy of gender equality because it's not only about bringing in a work environment or bringing in numbers, it's ensuring that the programs get implemented to be able to meet the policy targets that we've put in. Thank you. Now, we, we have a, a couple of questions also from, from the audience, of course, and, and, and if you are listening to us and you do have questions, don't hesitate. Uh, there's still a bit of time for us to raise them with our speakers, so please go ahead and send your questions. Uh, so the, the, the question I have here is uh, to Delphine O in particular. I am a researcher in computer science. I have worked in Brazil, Portugal, and now in France. I have found more women in computer science departments in Brazil and Portugal than in France. However, the French society is, in my opinion, less sexist and also more policies for gender balance uh, in science do exist. So do you have a comment on that paradox? Less women in computer sciences, but uh, uh, a less sexist uh, society says our uh, our audience member? <laughs> um, that's one of the um, dichotomies or complexities I was pointing in my uh, previous statement about the fact that there's um, a much higher percentage of women in science and scientific careers um, in the Arab world, uh, in actually all of the Arab nations almost, uh, than in the global north or in European countries, uh, even though, and I, I don't want to, you know, point particularly to the Arab world, but a number of countries have still discriminatory, discriminatory laws um, and uh, huge issues with gender-based violence and discriminations in society. Uh, but by contrast, and you could talk about Brazil, uh, by contrast, the number of women in science or computer science is higher. Um, do I have one explanation for this? Um, I don't uh, think so. Um, I would like to uh, refer to uh, a French researcher um, whose name is uh, Isabelle Collet, uh, who has uh, published and written extensively about the history of women, in, especially in computer science uh, and in STEM. And she has um, explained, uh, and, and, and I learned from her, um, that at the beginning, computer science was um, considered, um, um, you know, um, comparative to a secretary's work. It was basically typewriting. Um, and so at the beginning in the 70s and in the 80s, it was a, a female majority 
um, economic sector, and it was also a female majority um, um, higher education uh, uh, field. Um, and uh, by the time that computer science became, I would say, sexy and bankable, and that we needed more uh, developers, uh, and then you know the Microsoft and the IBM and the Apple uh, went big, um, the job actually became more attractive, and then the uh, salaries uh, became more important and then all of a sudden it became a male majority uh, um, uh, area, as, as economic sector and also uh, scientific and academic fields. So uh, unfortunately the history uh, shows us that uh, when an economic sector or a kind of job uh, becomes um, more attractive financially, so the salaries go up, then it's almost um, systematic that the number of men rise and the number of women uh, goes down and the reverse is also true uh, when a job such as you know being a nurse uh, or working in the health sector uh, becomes devalorized so less important in society and less uh, well um, uh, paid then the number of women grows um, but it's interesting that in countries like uh, Malaysia also for instance there's a uh, also higher number of women in computer science and it developing. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that um, uh, in order to work in computer science, you don't necessarily need to be in office, you can be at home. So you have much more flexibility when it comes also to reconciling your private client with your professional career. Uh, you can be at home, uh, you, you don't necessarily have office hours. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, by many accounts, actually, um, you know, computer science, at least this particular sector, is much more compatible with what we uh, see as you know, uh, women's private lives and, and women's work-life balance uh, than uh, than other sectors. Um, I would hope that in France and other uh, global north countries, we would have more also role models uh, going into uh, science and computer science and, and IT. Uh, we definitely uh, need also a public information campaign and specifically information at the primary and secondary education uh, levels. Thank you. Um, there are many more topics that we could have touched upon, particularly um, picking up on some of the comments that you made in your uh, respective presentations. Unfortunately, we're nearing the end uh, of this conference, and, and I'm sure that uh, uh, if you've been listening uh, to this uh, conference since this morning, you're probably zoomed out at this stage, although uh, it's really been very interesting and very um, inspiring to, to listen to. Um, but before we close uh, this particular session, I'd like to ask each of you for a, a one sentence conclusion. What would, you, what would your key takeaway be uh, out of this debate? What is to you the thing that needs to be done above all in order to promote uh, gender equality uh, using policy levers? which policy levers need to be used? What are the next steps? Um, so what, what, uh, what is your key takeaway from this session? Starting with you, Your Excellency Wakungu. Uh oh, I think that my key, <laughs> I think my uh, key takeaway is that policies are important, but they must be implemented and sometimes Quotas must be used, led by political will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm sorry, it's a bit of a million dollar question, but, uh, but I think it's important that our audience get, you know, these, these key takeaways uh, from you rather than from me, because uh, then they will be more striking. So, um, Dan Dutois, your key takeaway, your key uh, message. Um, well, I would have completely endorsed what the ambassador said, but I would I would say let let's not be scared to disrupt. Decisive action is needed. Good, call for action. Rosa Menendez Lopez. Uh, I would say it, uh, I will stress the the need to accommodate women's uh, reality to the design of public policies and programs. Thank you. So Delphine O. Oh. 
Ah, you seem frozen. I'm afraid we may have lost your connection. I will turn to uh, Renu Swarup, and I hope that in, in the meantime, uh, Delphine O will have had time to reconnect. Renu Swarup, so your takeaway. Thank you, Florence. I think the key takeaway that I have is that uh, we all are looking at policies which are important as an international agreement. So there needs to be more of an international consensus for key principles which get implemented across the world, maybe like an international mission on gender equality in science, technology, and innovation. That's a very interesting uh, suggestion, very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, proposal there. Um, Muin Hamzi, what's your key proposal or next uh, step or key takeaway? Uh, as simple as that, give women, we should give women the opportunity to lead international program and to lead some political and legislation. Uh, it will start by this. If women are not able to lead, they cannot obtain uh, the balance in managing any program or any sector of a country. Thank you. We seem to have definitely lost uh, Delphine O. I'm very sorry about this. I would have loved to have her final word. Maybe she comes back to us before the very, very end. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to thank all of you for your contribution to this discussion. I know we could have continued. Uh, maybe we can have another discussion of this kind on another occasion. There uh, is Delphine O. You're back. So good, because that allows me then to ask you for your final takeaway or your uh, very uh, final next steps. Thank you, sir, for this interruption. Um, I would like to build on uh, my, what my friend Judy said. Uh, when there is political will, uh, whether we're talking about political uh, circles or academic circles or research circles, then there is a way. So if the top of the institution, whether it's the CNRS or whatever institution it is, uh, wants to have parity and wants to have more women, there's always a way, whether it's quotas or uh, you know, uh, measures uh, for uh, work-life balance and so on, uh, to make sure that there's no glass ceiling anymore. So we need to have the support of the top of the institutions. Thank you very much. So it starts from the top, and I'm sure that's one of the conclusions that uh, our uh, concluding speaker is going to uh, mention as well. Uh, so welcome back, Elizabeth Kohler. Uh, good afternoon, because I haven't seen you yet today, but I know you were already um, on, the, uh, on the ground this morning and uh, part of the opening session. Um, so Elizabeth, um, what is your conclusion to this whole day, to this whole conference, to maybe the final panel or the two panels of the afternoon? Um, we'd love to hear your concluding remarks. Well, thank you very much for all. Well, uh, if there is one thing to say, I think uh, Renus Farouk said, we don't need only programs, but the right people. And today, for sure, we had the right people. So it was really brilliant, inspiring. And so thank you very much on, on behalf of CNRS to all panelists in the morning session the two round table, the two panel discussions today. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's amazing to see all these experience, but in some points we all agree that we, on one side, we need of a very strong political support. Agenda quality policies need to be embedded in policies at high level. But on the other hand, uh, well, it's also important to work on best practices to see how they can be uh, institutionalized. So it's, it's both a top-down and bottom-up approach, I think. And what's for sure is that we all have to learn from each other and that international cooperation as really a driver and can have a leverage effect on, on our own institution or national polities. So I'm um, fully supporting well, we, the idea of having maybe one day an international uh, gender equality unit trying to, to uh, really coordinate all these policies. But uh, we need also, I think, uh, 
uh, we need to trust to implement this. This is very important also. We can impose things or self-impose. The idea also is interesting with some noble effect maybe regarding some quotas, but basically, well, we need the right people and you were there, you were there so thank you so much to all of you and I give the floor to Florence to to definitely close the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elisabeth. Well, thank you all of you for taking part uh, in, in this discussion this afternoon. Thanks to uh, all those who followed us uh, throughout the day uh, online, because it can indeed be uh, a bit tiresome sometimes. And I know uh, because I was following as well that this conference wasn't. And that is greatly thanks to all of our speakers. Uh, thank you to the tech team behind the whole thing that made sure everything was going well and flowing. It is the end of the day, so have a nice evening almost. Uh, and most of all, all of you stay safe and take care. Bye bye. <laughs>